democracy. We recognize that the Huron Wendmen, Chippewa, and Haudenosaunee nations have walked on this territory over time. In times of great change, we recognize more than ever the importance of honoring Indigenous history and culture, and are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation, respect, and good health with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. So good evening, everyone. It's good to be back for an in-person council meeting. I think it's been two years and five months. And that, uh, yes, it's good to be back to be able to uh, meet in the Zoom room here and have members of public here and uh, be able to uh, discuss uh, the important matters of our town of Red West Wilbur. Council Fair Genie sends his regrets. Uh, he is in the Maritimes. Uh, he possibly will be uh, joining us by YouTube, but uh, uh, he does send his regrets, so uh, with that, we'll uh, move on to the agenda, and we did have a closed session, and we do have a uh, recommendation that comes out of the closed session, so that uh, it's to do with 514 and 516 home speak less. So the recommendation that council and approve the sale of 514 and 516 Holland Street West to 189-1456 Ontario Incorporated for the purpose of rental units and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign all documents necessary to give effect to the transaction. So a mover and a seconder for this. Uh, Councillor Sam Dew, Councillor Scott, any comments or questions? I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. So the adoption of agenda, we do have an on-desk item. So the adoption of the agenda is recommendation that the regular council agenda dated August 2nd, 2022 be adopted as amended to include report COR 2022-17 and bylaws 2022-76 and 2022-77. So a mover and a seconder for this, that uh, Councilor Scott, uh, Deputy Mayor LaDuke, and the on desk item is just uh, traffic bylaw amendments for the new school locations that we do have in our municipality to be able to get the traffic uh, uh, bylaws to be incorporated for the new school locations. So, any uh, further comments on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. At this time, Council, you may declare any pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. Seeing none, um, there's no presentations, but we do have a deputation. 8.1 Official Plan Review and County of Central Municipal Comprehensive Review. Okay, I've just been informed. He has withdrawn that. So that, uh, okay, we're not having that uh, deputation tonight. So we'll move on to open forum. So that, uh, yes, over the last two years, five months, uh, people have had to. Uh, send in their comments, but tonight we have uh, two people that have signed up for open forum. So first is Mauro DiGiviani, and uh, if you want to come forward, uh, Mauro, and uh, turn on the microphone, and it's uh, procurement activities that you want to discuss. I'm not going to be in the correct order here. Uh, I looked at the uh, list of items that were procured, and they obviously are above the uh, procurement amount that uh, the town has uh, set. Uh, one of the items I'll speak to you about is the surveillance cameras. Uh, that uh, were for $23,000. Um, how they were sole sourced, I'm not sure. Uh, so again, that was one of the ones. The second one would be the 
the software purchase. And again, it was sole sourced. Now that obviously leads me to questions because software is software. It doesn't uh, give up any uh, privacy or particular codes. So how it was sole sourced, I'm not sure. Um, and I hope that council asks some detailed questions of how these items were actually sole sourced. I think there are surveillance cameras. They're very generic and they can be swapped out from one to the other. So how it uh, was sole sourced because only one vendor. Um, again, I, I hope that discussions by council, uh, we can flesh that out. Uh, that leads me to another question I had. I didn't notice on the procurement. Uh, I had uh, some questions with regards to paving up at uh, the cemetery on the left line. Uh, apparently, there's supposed to be a tender on that. And uh, I did see it on the list, so maybe it didn't fall in the date range or uh, whenever they did the, I guess, the search. Uh, my understanding is that the tender went to a company but the actual people that did it was another company. And I'm not sure how it was paid for, or again, there might be some sort of uh, information there that I'm missing. Uh, so that's on the procurement. The other part I would like to discuss was the, the last, I guess, couple months, there's been a lot of discussion over the rezoning of the golf course. Uh, there was, I guess, a council meeting online and then there was actually a meeting by the, uh, I guess they call it developer builder, and many of the council members were actually there. Uh, my, hopefully, uh, and I'll ask the council, that uh, any decisions around that uh, get referred to, I guess, I'm gonna say November, December, uh, as we're uh, around the corner here for an election. And I've been talking to a lot of our residents and this has uh, become a very hot topic that will come up during the election. So I hope uh, maybe council will consider deferring any decisions of that uh, into, I guess, November or December, where there's a new council and then maybe a new mandate from the residents of Brad. Uh, that goes kind of the same question I had with the Joint Fire Department Board and the assigning, I guess, of some council members. We have, I guess, an election coming up, and I'm assuming with everybody who's going to be busy, I'm not sure if they had a responsibility of on a fire board right now. When if, if, if they do start, then in two months' time, they may or may not be the same people to be on, sitting on that board. So that might be something that gets deferred down. Again, it's your consideration. I'm tossing it in there. Um, and then, Obviously, the residents of Bradford can uh, make that decision come election time. Thank you. I hope I didn't take more than five minutes for worship. Council? No, thank you, Mr. Uh, but, uh, all good questions and all on the uh, agenda for tonight. So that, uh, and with open forum, it's not back and forth. So that uh, <coughs> when the reports come up, uh, quite possibly council members will ask the, the questions of staff. You uh, brought up if, uh, if it is uh, yeah, pertinent questions that, that uh, can be answered tonight. So next up we have Earl Glasky. So Earl, do you want to come forward? And it's with the Swar uh, project. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for your time this evening. Uh, I don't want to belabor, so I'll just go into this uh, in detail as as short as I can. All I wanted to find out is uh, the status on the actual project um, and if it's on track to be completed by the timeline that was set out for it being uh, October of uh, you know, 2022 for the first closure of line five and six. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Glaski. And uh, yes. Uh, We'll get more information for, to you, and uh, yeah, it probably won't be discussed tonight. But it, yeah, through our staff and that, we'll uh, we'll we'll send a response to you. Thank you. 
So I'll just ask our clerk that uh, that is all the uh, open forum requests. There is no online open forum uh, submissions. No, Your Worship. There are no email submissions of open forum tonight. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to item 10, adoption of minutes and committee as a whole recommendations 10.1. Adoption of council minutes. So the first recommendation is that the minutes of the regular council meeting dated June the 21st, 2022 be adopted as printed. So can I have a mover and a seconder for this? Uh, Councillor Orr, uh, Councillor Sandu. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried. The next recommendation is that the minutes of the special council meeting dated July the 19th, 2022 be adopted as printed. A mover and a seconder to this. Uh, Councillor Contois, seconder. Councillor Scott, any comments, questions? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried. Item 11, there is uh, no correspondence. So item 12, 12.1, staff reports. So it's report of corporate services. Noise bylaw exemption after by Mexican Canada Restaurant. So the recommendation is that report COR 2020 16 entitled Noise Bylaw Exemption Application. By Mexican Canada be received for information and the request for an exemption under the Noise Control Bylaw 2008 083 as amended to the application of sound music between 11 p.m. on Friday, August 19, 2022, and 30 a.m. on Saturday, August 20th, being either approved or denied. And that the request for an exemption under the Noise Control Bylaw 2008-083 is amended to the amplification of sound music between 11 p.m. on Saturday, August 20th, 2022, and 2 a.m. on Sunday, August 21st, 2022, to be either approved or denied. So can I have a mover and a seconder to get this on the floor, and then we'll uh, we'll leave the second two parts. So, so uh, Councillor Dyke will move it. The seconder, uh, Councillor Lamb. So comments or questions? Uh, Councilor Day. I want to first off and start off, was other restaurants, um, I'm surprised there isn't other restaurants involved or came forward because we have other patios and, uh, and we, uh, Carefi uh, Carefest is going to be uh, quite an event uh, since we haven't seen anything for two years, Brent, but I just, just want to know if anyone else has contacted you from the other Mexican restaurants or different es uh, establishments and and uh, what I'm trying to remember what when the, the biggest beer gardens we had was the village Inn and just I thought we had a cut off at 12 o'clock or something if just refresh my memories I guess we have a uh, rain fro frog in the last two years <laughs> so I just wanted to know an update on that yeah. so we have Brent Lee our manager of enforcement so I'll ask you Brent if you can comment and give a little bit overview of this. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Pepper, and to, to answer Councillor Blakey's question. Uh, I haven't heard from any other restaurants, restaurants uh, with either exemptions or, or even uh, question, questioning what uh, would be allowed on, on that date. Uh, maybe checking with Bethany would, would be a, a good idea as well. Um, generally speaking, our noise bylaw affords an exemption to commercial businesses to 11 p.m. at night. So that's the position the town has taken. You're, as a business, you're able to play music or, or noise till 11 p.m., and that's the, the cutoff threshold. Um, if you were wishing to kind of continue that live band or amplification of music beyond those hours, it would require a noise exemption. That's why uh, we have this report uh, here tonight. Uh, I did speak with organizing staff of Carrot Fest, and they had a general hours of operation. You know, what when the event goes till most vendors clear out at 6 o'clock, I understand. Um, they did have general hours of operation until around 11 or 12 o'clock at night, but it's not enforced. Residents are able to, to go amongst restaurants or businesses or downtown as they pleased. The town's not clearing people out at you know midnight to, to prepare for the next day or anything like that. So it, it's really um, open to the public, open to the businesses to kind of uh, roam around um, the downtown area and partake in the festivities. And uh, I did speak with this applicant. I'm not quite sure if they're here today. Um, they did say they, they plan on having some live music and amplification of sound for an outdoor patio. It's a little bit distinguished from the restaurant portion. 
and um, they want that to get into, continue into later evening to get more patrons, more business out to, to their restaurant. That's a good idea. Brent, I, I would just say that maybe a, 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 Beth can reach out to some of the bar, other establishments, because uh, we let one, and uh, we don't let the other ones. I think everybody should be be aware, full communication. Everybody understands. Everybody's on the same playing field. Because I know on Ward Seven, uh, there's a few establishments that that noise uh, noise uh, travels. So uh, I, I would just hope that we, uh, you know, we deal with this as best we can. Be. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very excited to see this event come alive again after a long two years. But uh, but you know, just just so it's all, everything's on the equal playing field. That's the bottom line. So if you could communicate and. Uh, and we'll never see what we do tonight with this bylaw. Okay, uh, other comments? Uh, <coughs> and then Councillor Orr. Well, thank you, Worship. <clears throat> yes, I'm excited to see Carrot come back in person. I'd love to see that. Uh, looking forward to the event. The issue is, though, that uh, I think in the past we've always enjoyed the uh, event and around 11 or 12, it seems to peer out and, and slow down. So. I'm not, I'm not in favor of extending the exemption from noise by law right now. I, I uh, think that's a slippery slope for us. It, it would be uh, uh, summer weekends. We'd want to have that more and more. They'd want to see something like that. So I'm going to uh, not support the motion or I'm going to request uh, put a, that we don't uh, support the exemption. We stick with our 11 o'clock uh, by law. I think it's uh, late enough and I think they can move the entertainment inside. So uh, if we do that uh, with one business, like we talked about, uh, Council Becky, we're going to have others that are going to want to do that, and you'll have the whole town uh, uh, making noise until 1 or 2 in the morning, and that's not fair to the residents. As much as it's a great event, I love Carrick Fest, I hope a lot of people get out and enjoy that event, but at the same time, I think we respect the fact that there is a, a, a definite cut off for noise, and I think that's uh, 11 o'clock is uh, late enough for most residents. I will not support the uh, exemption. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Warren and Councillor Uh Thank you, Worship. Um, yeah, when I when I read the uh, submission, my I, I'm just concerned that, uh, and I understand uh, the business's uh, concern with wanting to make more money uh, because of COVID, getting getting more customers in and doing things. But we have to look at uh, where that I look at where that patio is, where that patio is, and where uh, there's uh, a lot of people live in that area that have had issues. Uh, with uh, with that noise and to go to two o'clock in the morning I think is uh, is uh, not feasible at this time I, I can't support them in that way. so uh, I won't be supporting the motion as is anyway Councilor Lamb actually there's there's two different uh, situations here the whether your patio is on private property or whether your patio is on the street and uh, as an extension of license uh, in Ontario, on the street they would say you have to stop serving by uh, midnight and all signs of service going. Music stops at 11 as per our bylaw. On a private property situation, like La Mex or Mexico Canada, is they can still serve until 2 a.m. on their patio. They just can't have music. They can have the music inside, so they can still function. But whereas if somebody has extended out to the street and got a stage on the street, they then uh, have to ensure that the numbers that are going into the building uh, adhere to the liquor board or the, the license, you know, your capacity. And on the outside, then uh, they're out of luck. So they got a counter here and a counter there and the liquor inspectors come down every year and they check that out. So it's, it's self-policing. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, some of the ones that have the patios at the back on, on their private property, it, they don't necessarily have that music, but they can still serve and they can still, uh, you know, do it quietly and move the music inside. Whereas uh, uh, people that uh, move their license establishment onto the street have to adhere to a different standard. So I think 11 o'clock is good enough. I mean, they party all day. If they're going to party Friday night, then they're going to party Saturday night. And at some point, some people got to go home. So anyway, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a fun time, and I'm pretty happy that uh, the town's going to be able, to, you know, to celebrate the end of COVID. Okay, hey, thanks, Councillor Leo. Other comments, questions, uh, Councillor Sandy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, 
similar to the other comments, uh, I would love to see the event, but I don't know, based on the report, we already seen six complaints within one month about noise from this establishment. Um, I think 11 o'clock outside is good. Inside, like Councilor Lamb said, they can play the music uh, till their closing time, which is 2 a.m. or 1.30. Um, the question I have for Brent, in your 4.6, section 4.6, it says the person applying for the exemption shall take all reasonable actions to notify all persons who may be affected. Can you please explain to me what in staff's mind reasonable actions is? Can they put a post on Facebook and say, if there was an exemption, allow, say, we're gonna have music till 1.30, is that, in your mind, satisfied that condition, or do you expect the business owner to knock on every door? Through Mayor Pepper, the, the Council of Sandu, it's a great question, and honestly, not something I've really contemplated until now. Usually when we get these applications, it's like a, a backyard wedding, right? So talk to your neighbors, and, and that really satisfies that requirement. And I guess here, because you're talking about impact to residential apartment buildings, there are quite a, a few units there that would be impacted by this. So I think, you know, reasonable notifications should be provided, whether that's, a, you know, a, a social media post or uh, some notices around their business, that, that probably would, would satisfy that section, uh, as opposed to individual delivery to, to each apartment building. Um, there's some other businesses in the area that might be affected as well. So really to your neighbors and anyone that you could, you know, plausibly think that would be affected by the noise, trying try to let them know that, hey, um, you know, if you hear noise at one o'clock on Saturday night, uh, this isn't a police call, they've been provided an exemption to council. If the town has a role to play in that and, and notifying, you know, the media public, then, then we could do that as well. So uh, generally speaking, that would be kind of what I would anticipate. Thank you. Other comments? It seems like uh, the majority have spoken to deny the, uh, the request for the uh, noise exemption. We do realize that the uh, West Canada can still carry on business indoors with their, their live band. It's just that it's the, the, the sound uh, outside and the, the patio that we are concerned about can just have an equal uh, playing field for all the different uh, restaurants in our downtown at this time. It appears that, uh, so Councillor Dykey, I believe you moved, yeah. uh, are you all right with uh, denial and yes. denying and uh, I forget who seconded it. Yeah. Yes. Council Lamb. Yeah, I think. So that uh, both of them will be denied the noise bylaw exemption application. Yeah. 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 So we're all right, moved by Councilor Dyke, seconded by Councilor Lamb. So I'll call for the vote now on, uh, on this uh, recommendation. So all those in favor of the recommendation that it is denied, so. And any opposed? So it is carried. But as members of council said, we are looking forward to Carrot Fest and uh, look forward to uh, the festivities. Item 12.2, the Board of Corporate Services, and that's procurement activities, 2022, first and second quarters. So the recommendation is that report COR 2022-17 entitled Procurement Activities, 2022, first and second quarters, be received for information. So a mover and a seconder for this. That Councillor Contois, Deputy Mayor LeDuc, comments and questions. Deputy Mayor. Yes, thank you, Worship. And uh, certainly, we always uh, we, we always make sure that if we're doing single source, we want to know why. So, I understand with the uh, compressor, uh, and I, I guess I recommend for a question for Vanessa. The compressor, seeing it's simple energy refrigeration, uh, that makes sense. It's their product, I think, to stay tuned. So, the UV, though, I, I see the UV. Uh, about the UV, I know it says if you did with water and ice in North America. I just wondered if that uh, any reason why we had to stay with them. And just wanted, just wanted to know what 
I know in the report it talks about the compatibility, that maybe there was more cost to change that. that, that uh, I just want to know if that was the real reason that it was, there would be more work in order to change from water and ice to another bed. Thank you, Debbie. Here with you. Um, in terms of the UV units, it is for the compatibility reasons, not just for the units themselves, but also for the staff that have to operate the units. Um, there's cost in procuring new units, training. Uh, it's just for efficiency of running the leaders. Okay, other questions? Uh, Councilor Seeing as we had some questions uh, earlier on, uh, the um, surveillance cameras. Um, so we're saying that the surveillance cameras were, what is the absence of competition? Maybe you would uh, describe that as to why, uh, or what, what that entails. Thank you, Councillor Orr. Uh, looking further at that rationale, it appears I may have made a mistake. It's not a sole source, it's a single source. And it would be for compatibility. As you can see, we use Walwyn integrated systems. That is our current provider for security systems at the Leisure Center. So we purchased the cameras from Walwyn in order to be compatible with the existing system that is already there. They are under contract for that surveillance system, so that is why the purchase went through them and it was not tendered separately. Well, well, thank you, because it, it just I, I just wanted to, uh, the compatibility that that explains as to why. And then the uh, software, um, let's just describe uh, the, uh, maybe we have to have our, our techie uh, uh, person here describe why the software was assessing. So, thank you, thank you, Councilor. I'll take a stab at it first, and if we have to, yeah. I can defer to Chris. Um, in terms of the backup software, this was, it was single source, but we did seek additional, we, we sought quotes to get to X10 network. Um, the reason why we chose this avenue is for, as I stated in the report, uh, we don't want to disclose what software we're using. As you may be aware, municipalities are often targets of ransomware. So the less we have out in the open, the safer we will be. Council Dyke? It, it's not in my report, but uh, in, in uh, open forum, uh, there was a request about uh, the, the cemeteries, uh, and, and I got I got a cornered uh, in in town, uh, and I just want an explanation from staff how that contract feels awarded, and then it wasn't done, and someone else did it. How this all came to play? Yeah, uh, just like an explanation. Thank you, Councillor Dyke. Um, to my knowledge, the driveways at the Mount Pleasant Cemetery yeah. were repaved using our rostered contractor for asphalt sidewalk curb maintenance. Uh, in terms of who did the work, it may have been a subcontractor of the contracted contractor. So I can look into that. I wasn't provided that detail, but it wasn't um, sent to open market because we have a roster of companies to do that type of maintenance work around town. Yeah, I just bring it up just because I happen to be somewhere in a public location and I was approached and the local contractor was understanding that he had it and was surprised to find out. You know, I don't want to bring up any negative advice, but I just, just like the explanation and so on, and stuff like this. <coughs> uh, Pastor Lamb. Yeah, can we uh, give a a brief report uh, as to what, what happens when um, preferred contractors that come in the beginning of the season and give you a price and stuff, then subcontract, at least if we know, then uh, we can give an explanation. Because we, uh, we do get people coming to us and say, hey, what about that, what about that, what about that? And, uh, uh, you know, we don't micromanage, we set policy, but it's still nice to know. Thank you, Councilor Lamb. I will definitely look at that and get something to you. Councilor Pantoff. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to jump aboard here. Uh, I don't think there's anything against the rules of subcontracting. Subcontracting happens all the time. And correct me if I'm wrong. 
when I was in the field, subcontracting is part of the job. That's what happens. When the big contractors come in, they subcontract. They bring in the professionals that know what they're doing and they do the job. So I don't see what this problem is because I don't think uh, there's anything <coughs> against the rules about subcontracting. So I'll leave that at that. So I just don't want that to become an issue. So I'll, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Thanks, Councillor Conchwa. No, you're correct. Subcontracting is permitted as long as it's the question is asked and the town approves. Um, I will look into uh, what transpired for those works and get back to you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa Morum is our uh, manager of procurement. So, uh, yes, thank you for the explanations. And uh, um, you're always uh, open to uh, emails to. Uh, to uh, Council members to find out more information. So thank you for that. So thank you for this explanation. So we have a uh, recommendation on the floor. So with that, I'll call for the vote. So all all those in favor? And it is carried. So I'll move on to item 12.3, report of community services, and it's speed mitigation, New Dasher Boulevard. So the recommendation is the report COM 2022-31 entitled Speed Mitigation New Dash Boulevard be received for inversion and the council consider as part of the 2023 and future budget process the approval of a preemptive count program to conduct traffic cuts on all appropriate roadway segments within the urban boundary every two years, so half the town each year, and the council consider as part of the 2023 budget Funding for the hiring of a consultant to develop in conjunction with the public, council, and staff a complete guide for speed mitigation measures, including processes for warrants, measures, and application in the town of Brad, West Wilmbury, and the council endorsed the creation of a web page once the required information has been gathered that will allow residents to access information regarding traffic issues and data, and the council approved the ability for residents or, or organizations to pay into a fund for traffic mitigation with the ultimate installation location based on the priority list. So moving to second for this, uh, Councillor Dyke, Councillor Contois, comments or questions? Quite a uh, uh, report, good report with a lot of recommendations here and I know that we do hear a lot of uh, issues, complaints, emails about uh, speeding and, and uh, traffic in general. general. So a lot of councillors' hands up. So Councillor Dyke, we start with oh, you. Thank you, Your Worship, thank you. Um, what I really like about this report is the fact that a fund that can go into, uh, you know, can be raised or a private a private neighborhood or, or a private uh, individual can uh, has a concern of a neighborhood that can come forward to the committee and uh, and uh, put money towards to help us uh, fund it. Because in the, the day, uh, like I said, I know the traffic committee and I respect where they're coming from. I know Gary and the group has worked very hard, it hasn't been an easy project and an easy committee to, to manage. As, you know, it's, it's not easy at the end of the day, but, but you know, this gives us an opportunity to look at if, if a neighborhood sees a problem and uh, uh, maybe the data that the committee has or the police has with the volume of traffic, um, the neighbors don't agree and it gives us an opportunity for them to to self-fund, I know Raj and I once had a, had the discussion. We didn't agree on on that privately. Someone should be able to pay for it. But I believe my view is if a neighborhood sees a problem and if they want to fundraise or personally put money into it, and that could minify or help a situation on the street. And I'll give an example: uh, Maple Grove. I'll be the first one to say if I had the opportunity, I was at Good Roads with um, uh, Mayor Keffer. And I've seen an opportunity of, of being able to buy those uh, mit mitigations at a trade show that I could have bought at the time to bring back to Bradford. But it did, did, didn't allow me that, that opportunity to be able to buy it to bring to the town. Now we have this avenue that we can bring it to your committee. It can be funded by the neighborhood or myself and to provide a situation for the residents that are upset about. It, it gives us an alternative to, to, to open-minded to this whole situation. I'm glad to see this report written this way. And I, and I thank you, Paul, for, for writing it. 
Thank you, Councillor Sandu, and then Councillor Conrad. Thank you, Thank you, Your Worship. Paul, thank you for your report. A um, couple of questions. Even though I like all the recommendations, uh, the last one I, I don't feel comfortable because when residents come and say they want to pay towards this, it's out of frustration because they feel we're not doing anything. They feel that we're saying we don't have funds and they already pay high enough taxes and they say, we'll help you fund it. If there's an ability to do it, yes, but I don't want people to think out there that this council or the future councils are not going to do anything that's safety related because they're waiting for you to pay for it. I don't think that's the case. Um, traffic committee uh, with Chair Lamb and, and staff, I think we have done a very good job given um, all the resources we have on our hands, and we will continue to do it. The questions that I have here is, you speak of a consultant, which the price tag is 100 and, uh, 150 to $250,000 for a consultant. I, I think we did the warrants now, and, and I just need to understand that better, because you've been doing a great job, the staff's been doing a great job, that's a huge chunk of money. The second question, I'll just ask the three together. And then the second question I have is the item three and four under finances. The, the road marking for a slow sign is 350, yeah. but a 40 kilometers an hour is 750 each. You know, why is that? It's, it's the same amount of letters with, with uh, one extra. But the price is double. Why is that? And, and uh, the, the multiple consultant. That's not sitting good with me. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Sandu, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, I'll try to hit everything, and please, if I miss anything, just ask for clarification. In terms of the consultant, um, you know there there are warrants out. Uh, different municipalities have different warrants in place. Uh, what works for one doesn't work for another. In this case, this really needs to be almost like a master plan for the town. It's not simply just a basic warrant. There needs to be consultation with staff. There needs to be consultation with council. There needs to be consultation with residents. This is a fairly large project in itself. Uh, it requires a lot of time to be able to do it and to meet the uh, needs and demands uh, of those that uh, are affected by it. In, in terms of the roadway signage, uh, the slow signage is, uh, through alphabetical, they're pre-cut, they're, they're done on bulk. The 40 kilometer an hour road signs we have, they're custom made. So that's why you're seeing the cost differential between the two. Well, that's Thank you. Um, going back to the consultant, but if we have done our mass transportation plan, isn't bulk of our work done and then the warrants is just an add-on that can be a lot cheaper, or or this is a separate project on its own that's going to cost that much money. Some of it will have to be sussed out through the procurement process. Uh, if we are able to take items from the GMP that we already have in place, it's, it's a bonus to us. Um, any of the tools that we already have uh, are, are a great benefit. Um, ultimately, through the procurement process, it will dictate what's required in, in terms of us getting the final product. Okay, Councilor Conflaw, then Councilor Scott. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, this is a great report. Uh, you've taken pretty much what Council has uh, asked for for the last few years and, and, uh, and made it happen. Uh, this is a, uh, we're mapping the whole community and, and basically the data collected is uh, probably the fairest way we can uh, implement uh, mitigation devices in neighborhoods. Uh, so. This, in, in essence, you know, um, takes some of the control out of uh, a counselor's hands. So, for instance, if, if someone was screaming at me nonstop, and I feel like I need to get this person speed bumps, and the data doesn't, you know, uh, say that this speed bump uh, is going to occur, then it, it actually puts me in check, because this all goes to the tax rate. Um, and, and it has to be justified. So. You know, the, the old scenario, if you scream the loudest, you get it. Not anymore. The data will prove it, and, and it's going to be town-wide 
and it needs to happen. We've got mitigation devices coming throughout the whole community, uh, or sorry, the community, and uh, we're going to have radar, uh, uh, ticket issues, uh, cameras, uh, as soon as the courts approve us, and that's what we're waiting on, and every device knowing to man. We've been asking for it, we're delivering it. Promise made, promise kept to this community. But in saying that, we're in a community, folks. Slow down. Uh, you live here. And I don't mean the people in this room. I'm talking about the ones out there that just don't give a damn. And it's, and it's a few people. It's not a lot. But it's enough people to cause a disturbance. But I think we've addressed the issues here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. I had questions the same as Raj. I, I looked at the road markings and, and I saw those prices and I went, really? I understand it. So here's my next question. If we're going to paint the roads, uh, I heard that we have a two-year guarantee on each one of these. Is that correct? So if we paint the uh, uh, the slow sign on the road, it should uh, should last for two years. Is that is that what we're looking at? Because I don't, I'm not seeing that. It really depends on the amount of road uh, maintenance that's required, primarily over the winter. If it's an especially bad winter, even with the markings, they can peel up. Um, it, it's not a guarantee for the two. So my final comment, would it make more sense to hire in-house a painter and put them on staff? Uh, because I see this as being uh, something that this community is going to be doing over and over and over again. And uh, I worked for the school board. They hired tradespeople to do exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I just want to put the question out there. And, and maybe, maybe it, it's justified, maybe it's not. Okay, thanks, Councilor Contra. Something to uh, consider. Uh, Councilor Scott? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's another great report, and thank you for all your help over the past uh, couple of years, you and Sergeant Phillips. Uh, when I think of everything we've done, uh, even just in my neck of the woods, digital radar assigned to Bridge Street, yeah. the speed decals on Simcoe or Cassette, the speed bump on Walker, the digital radar sign on Colburn. Uh, Sergeant Phillips was visiting with some residents last week and was able to report it's almost cut the problem in half. Uh, and I think I think we know what the problem is, and we didn't invent speed bumps in Bradford, and we didn't invent digital radar signs in Bradford. So, like Councillor Sandu said, I'm not wild about hiring a consultant. I think the problem that we've encountered with the speed bump pilot is actually when we didn't listen to your advice and tried to spread the peanut butter too thin rather than focusing on the areas you identified in the volume you identified and thinking of your original recommendation was for three speed bumps on Walker. We're now going back and we're going to put an additional one to bring it up to two when we could have perhaps just done three in the first place. So I don't want to spend money on a consultant for us to just then second guess it and have essentially wasted the money. What I'd rather do next term, subject to that council's approval, is actually have a special council meeting and have it all out once and for all at uh, the midway point, say, of the first year. And that way we can take your data and your expertise and police's data and their expertise and the political imperatives that are coming from the community because we all know that there are three types of lies. And the first one is lies themselves, the second is damn lies, and the third is statistics. And you can skew them any way you want. So I'd rather not spend money on a consultant. I'd rather take all the inputs we already have and figure it out as a council and as a community. And then finally, Councillor Sandu also mentioned this, but I'm not in favor of the final recommendation about being able to pay into a fund. I was leery about it when we did it for street naming, but because it was for charity, I thought that was an interesting thing to try. But we provide public service, and you don't get to buy your way to the front of the line, at least not in Canada. And especially in this case, reading the fine print of that recommendation, you wouldn't be buying your way to the front of the right. line you'd actually just be paying into a pot and it might not ever solve your problem. So I, I think that's uh, double bad. If you pay to get to the front of the line, uh, that's not how we do it in Canada, but you also wouldn't be getting what you thought you were paying for under this. So I, I'm, I'm doubly against it in that sense. But all in all, I think it's a good report and this council has done leaps and bounds on speed mitigation. I, I think what we need to do is we need to look at the problem areas next term and uh, sort of figure them out once and for all. I don't think we need to hire a consultant to do it. Okay, thank you, Councilor Scott. Uh, Deputy Mayor Levy. Thank you, Worship, and uh, 
thank you everyone for those comments. This this report to me is a fantastic report. I think it's it's you know what, Chair Glam, I think it's this report reflects what this traffic community has been doing for the last eight years. And that's finding a solution to our problem in our community. To me, we want to respect all the taxpayers' dollars, but I do want to see if it's solved. I want a plan. I want an actual plan to say how we're going to do this in the future. One life saved is worth it. So we've had lives already lost in Bradford on Holland Street with accidents and traffic issues. I believe the consultant can bring us a plan, bring us a report that can help us with the warrants, help us with how we decide how we do traffic mitigation, bring new ideas to the table. We've been to we've been to FCM, we've been to the conferences, we've seen some of the technology out there. We're not the experts in it, but we've actually seen some great technology. We've brought some technology to our community. So I believe that this consultant, if we do it, and I hope we get on the lower end, this consultant can bring us a report that we really want to have help us. Because this traffic committee has worked hard over the last eight years to get to this point. I think, I think Paul, you hit it on the head with everything. I love every recommendation. I, I, I love the preemptive counts. I think that's what we need to do. We need to have that data. It's like we just said, Dr. Scott, it's data-driven. We want to be data-driven, and I think the consultant can bring that also. I still, you know, I, I'm, I'm great with uh, I'm, I'm great with also the uh, the, the hiring of the consultant. I'm, I'm great with the uh, the web page. I think that's an absolute uh, gem for us. I think that'll help residents uh, find their way through the system. Uh, it's like Councilor Conto said, we want to have checks and balances so the residents can go see it on the website. I think that's a great opportunity for us. I think it puts the graphic committee back to work and allows us to do what we really need to do, and that's drive policy, drive it, drive issues, ad hoc. You know, ad hoc decision making uh, at those meetings is the toughest thing for us to do. Uh, we, we, we sometimes give in, and I'd rather have the policy set in place, I'd rather have a plan put forward that helps us uh, make those decisions a lot clearer. We've been great, we've done a great job. Some of these costs are, uh, in my mind, not that bad. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can deal with some of these uh, mitigation issues, but I think that the most important part is to consult and bring that, that full plan to the, to the table for us and review with that. So I love it, I even, I do, you know, I, I was one that didn't want to have residents donate to uh, uh, to the, the town to help with these traffic mitigation issues, but in the end, uh, if you fill out your tax form, the CRA at the bottom says if you'd like to donate your re refund back to the, to the country of Canada, please do so. We're obviously doing the same thing. But I think if we do this, if we do that where you, you get to donate to this to, to prioritize some of these things, I think they need to understand, the donor needs to understand that this does not reflect where he thinks it's going to go. It has to go into a pot, and they have to understand that that's where it's going to, to do uh, uh, on the speed mitigation for other But other than that, I love the report, and, I, and as long as we do this priority list where we do this uh, uh, you know, donation portion, if we do that and make it right, I think people can understand that they're just going to help with, uh, with opportunities in the budget. We've done, we've done great with our budgeting for uh, speed mitigation in the past, and I, I really appreciate this report, and I'm uh, fully going to support it the way it's written, and I appreciate that, Paul. I, I don't have really a question. I think it was just a great written report, and I, uh, I love the, I love the, I love the solutions in it. That's what I really like. So, thank you. The deputy mayor, uh, Councillor Orr, and then Councillor Lance. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, uh, if anybody doesn't realize our traffic committee, what they've gone through in the last eight, like eight years, even the last four years, probably, uh, it's been very heavy on them to come up with solutions and. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to speak to uh, Blue Datcher at this point, Blue Datcher Boulevard, because I know the people are are concerned, and uh, and I and I want to bring and the point I was bringing up, uh, Deputy Mayor, was uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, report. It basically is saying that, in, and I'm not sure that a lot of people would understand that, and that has to be brought out. That uh, I'm sure Blue Datcher is having an event to raise. Uh, some funds which they would like to to uh, get uh, speed bumps installed. Uh, with this report, is saying that money would go into a uh, fund, and uh, in this report, it's saying that Blue Dasher is well down the, the list as needing uh, speed bumps. So I think it's just a you know we, we need to make sure that we communicate if we're going to do this. So one thing that I want to make sure if if this is going to happen that our legal people is uh, is on board with uh, how that would uh, carry on and uh, um, that um, everything is done, the paperwork is proper for pe that people know what's going to happen with that money. So, uh, I have a concern doing this. I, I, I understand the, the mindset of the people. Uh, speed is, is a huge issue in our community. 
And, you know, we've had too many deaths. We've had two motorcycle deaths in this town in the last month. One on one in town and one on uh, um, Pennell Road, which I happened to be there. And uh, it was uh, just speed, just speed. And uh, we need to uh, really, I don't know, educate, but obviously, hopefully with the cameras bringing in that people get hit in the pocket and hopefully you think about slowing down. So, um, but I wanted to bring that out that people understood that uh, on, on based on this report that that money wouldn't be specific for their road and their domain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, Councillor Lamb, I'll leave you uh, to the last. You're the chair of our traffic committee and you do a really good job. And, uh, as other council members have said, that well, is, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's quite an onerous uh, responsibility, and I'm a pragmatic, data-driven guy. And when somebody was complaining, and we uh, we, we started to develop uh, the, the data, uh, and uh, we were also in a situation where we we've been paving roads. We've got good. We're getting better roads out there. Cars are fantastic, but people think they're sterling moths. And, and that's a problem. When we, we started with the camera project, because we're not allowed to, uh, to send fines, but we were sending photos of the offending automobile, and I've had a couple of parents come to me and say, my kid was doing 69 and a 40, and he's driving for a month now. So that, that kind of helped. Uh, the city of Toronto puts about 21 to 25,000 tickets out a month. Uh, in, the, in the city of Toronto, and that's like a $180 million um, uh, project. But we can't just, uh, we also went through COVID, so as Sergeant Phillips and the, and the local constabulary uh, are doing a great job, but if, if you write a ticket for 16 over, it ain't, it ain't going to court, uh, especially when the courts were closed. So you gotta get the person that's doing 40 over in the, in the, in the 40. Or if you get a situation, and most of the serious traffic accidents are on uh, on 80 kilometer roads, uh, County Road 4, Highway 11 North, 27, um, 88, and that, uh, quite frankly, in town, 90% of the people drive well. They drive well, it's just the other 10%. And we've got to be very careful in, in trying to mitigate uh, the 10% and, and bother the other 90% that are innocent. So somehow we've got to target them. And the only way we can do that is with data. I, you know, we've had people, uh, we had a fellow, I'm not gonna mention a name or a street. He was insisting people are doing 100 kilometers an hour. So Paul put the, the hoses out there. The 40% or the 85% that was 37. Uh, we've, we've had our, uh, and Sergeant Phillips, and now the chief is retiring, I'm afraid we're gonna, Sergeant Phillips is gonna get kicked upstairs somewhere. And the guy's great, you know, he's, He'll go to people's houses and talk to them and say, your kid did this. Or that time when there was a film of the, of the person, of, of the kid in the car going around people at the school and, and when they showed it to the dad, he was quite perturbed. Uh, so this is, how, how do you fix a problem when it isn't the whole community? But I like to harken back then at Elmer the safety elephant. When I was a kid, Elmer was out there and it was, Stop, look, and listen. We don't do that. We're not street proofing our kids. People have got headphones on and are walking out in front of people. I'm surprised more aren't to, to get hit. But I'm just saying that that by using data, we're able to target it a little bit better. And now that the courts are going to be open again, um, you know what? The insurance rates will go up because they're going to be out there. But remember, Every time there's an accident on 27, we got coppers that are going to be out for a day and a half because we're measuring and doing all that stuff like that. This isn't like Florida where in 15 minutes they shovel you off the highway and, and throw you in the, in the hearse and send you down the road and, uh, and they got to get traffic going because they have a bylaw like that or you can't, you, know, you can't block a highway for more than 45 minutes. Our people do the right thing because the town has liability for the system that the transportation system that they provide. Uh, so we have to be, you know, we got deep pockets, uh, allegedly, according to the, uh, you know, Shyster, Penangle, and Al out there. Um, so we've got to, we've got to do everything twice as good. And uh, 
I don't know. I, you know, I've gotten lots of support from uh, my, my council members, but uh, we also have some people that just never give up. And, and you can show them that this is the way it is. And we've, we've had police officers go out with, with radar guns. I think you rode with a radar gun once, Raj. And, you know, when you say, oh, that person's doing 63, and then you put the gun on them, they're doing 42. Public perception is, is, is quite, quite an interesting thing. And then, as everybody said here, they think you're being ignored. But I think it is a dangerous precedent to allow a neighborhood to say, we'll pay for the speed bump right there when they don't need it. I, I think that uh, it's really, we need to put them, if we do those humps, and we did a, uh, some test situations, and Councillor Scott talked about the one on, uh, on uh, uh, Walker, and that was quite interesting. It was like a mountain. Uh, but that, that little street, which wasn't a commuter street, it was a neighborhood street. These are neighbors. That was a crazy street. Like, in a 40, they were doing like 58. So we put that in, but then they made up for it down the street, so now we gotta put another one in. Uh, so the, the problem is, is that quite often it's just neighbors. And it's also volume. If you take Northgate, Northgate has like almost 5,000 cars a day, and it's servicing 700 houses in there. But for the most part, people are really good. And those little ballers that we got out there dropped the speed limit by seven kilometers an hour, and. Uh, you know, so little things, but under all the new design options in town when we're talking about, you know, I, I'm a, not a big fan of cookie cutter streets. I think we need to, uh, to, to now, and we're talking about that, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, and, and uh, the and town manager mentioned that they're actually considering what I had suggested before, that you don't have to have the center of the road on the center of the pavement. It can be over here like this. Then you can change your parking, because parking is a problem as well when you're trying to control uh, speeds and, and uh, oh, and, and I know stop signs are just suggestions to lots of people and uh, it's, um, anyway, it's very vexing to have to deal with this problem. But we're giving it a try and uh, you, can get, you can get this report on the computer, even the public now, and you can see where the streets are and, and uh, where the problem isn't. But, uh, I think some of our speed limits might be actually too low. Uh, we, we've reduced the uh, speed limits in this town in late 80s. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, in the, in the 80s to 40 kilometers from 50 interior ones, uh, the town of Bradford uh, Council. But we took a tool away from ourselves because then, because we reduced all the interior streets to 40, um, we didn't have the opportunity to drop at 10 just to say, look, we did something just to slow them down a bit. So it's, uh, it is what it is, and I'm looking forward to a post-COVID uh, uh, solution. I'm looking forward to um, more uh, solutions as we've come up with, and I think those signs in the streets are working. Um, and I know that uh, the ones we put in Bond Head, the permanent signs, the permanent speed signs, the one in Colbert Street, I know this is working. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have some streets that are still problematic, but most of them are people's neighborhoods. And if the people would just take ownership of their, own, of their own neighborhood and say, look, why do you drive like that? But anyway, I, I'm just, I sound like I'm campaigning, but I'm not. I, uh, I actually believe in, in this. So uh, thank you for listening to me, and I've given the same speech many times. Uh, but you guys are still buying interest. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Councilor Adam. Uh, you did mention traffic cameras. I wonder, Paul, yeah. do you have any update about uh, the City of Toronto if they're able to send tickets uh, <coughs> uh, with the court system and things like that with COVID? Uh, any uh, hope of being able to send tickets to uh, residents that are speeding from uh, cameras? Thank you, Mayor Kepper. Uh, there's, there's a bit of a, an update kind of on two fronts. Uh, on, on one side, MTO earlier this year allowed the uh, speeding tickets to go through the AMP system, which I know councils received reports on through uh, Brent and uh, bylaws error enforcement. Um, through AMPs, we can now, instead of going to the courts, actually uh, have the tickets go through the program here. Um, that makes life a little bit easier, but obviously there's a bit of time to, to set it up. With the, the delay with court services, it's also allowed us to talk to other municipalities that are wanting to do something similar. 
So it, it's, it's letting uh, smaller municipalities that might not quite have either volume numbers or purchasing power of larger municipalities get together and see if there's other options that, that we can move forward with. So it is something that is on the radar for hopefully early next year, um, hopefully sooner, we'll see. But uh, it, it is something that day by day we are learning what other places are doing. Good, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, I'll just go back to Gary. You yeah. have a comment? Yeah, further than that, my understanding is that um, the, the data coming from the camera doesn't automatically just go into a computer and send a ticket. This has to be examined by uh, people that are qualified as by law inspectors, so a human being has to look at the information so that when you've got a, a, a room full of people looking at this, it may take a half an hour to process each one. And the City of Toronto uh, last or last year, they said they, they weren't able to send out 50,000 tickets because they just didn't have enough time and enough people to be able to do it. So this is relatively new technology. I know we used to uh, used to go, photo radar, that's, I'm Canadian. But uh, you know what, if somebody's doing 75 and 40, they deserve to get that $400 ticket. So uh, I, I'm the biggest fan of that one. And I think that, uh, you know, you, you put a copper on the street, it costs you a couple hundred grand. Uh, and then you got court time and overtime and all kinds of stuff. And then they you know, hire a shite to make on how again to try to, you know, beat it down to 15 over so they don't lose any points. Okay, I think Councilor Lamb. I bet. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Good. Okay, uh, I saw hands yeah, up over here. So, Councillor Dyke and then Councilor Actually, Scott. You, you hit it. The question I had was, was the Paul, just how soon, when, four years ago, uh, you know, traffic was at the top of the, one of the top uh, issues in our municipality, and it still is a top, top uh, issue. And, and I wish hopefully that this camera system uh, comes into play at some point, uh, because I've noticed in the last, uh, maybe the COVID or whatever, but I find more and more aggressive drivers uh, today, at the end of the day, I don't maybe because I'm watching the teen the teenagers now driving more, more so. Uh, but, but I find that there's many more aggressive drivers. So we need to, to uh, well the future council needs to continue to to work on this and to uh, and to get these cameras in, in place and and continue to work on this. And and I still, you know, I know what how many of you uh, disagree, but I still believe that a neighborhood should has the right to to investigate. Uh, and, and put some money back in the neighborhood if they should, uh, privately funded if, if they can. But but that's my view. So we all are in this free country. We can do what, say what we want to say. Okay, thanks, Councillor. <coughs> and uh, Councillor Scott, um, I won't belabor the one about the consultant because it's a budget consideration anyway. But could we vote on all of this except vote on the last one separately, the private fund? Okay, I'll look through our Um no the way I read it, that, that the, the bottom item, it will be real. So I'll look to Rebecca. Uh, is that suggestion? Did, can we vote on the, the first uh, four. four budget items and then uh, the other would be to have an amendment? To I, I believe Councilor Scott's introducing a motion to amend to split the motion um, so Council can vote on the, that amendment to split it. Okay, so uh, seconder then to split the, the motion. Councillor Sandy seconds it. So we'll have to vote just to, to, to allow a, a split of the recommendation. So all those in favor? And it is carried. So the first recommendation then is the first four points. So we've had a good discussion, so we'll vote on that. So all those in favor of this uh, report and the recommendations of the first four? Any opposed? And it is carried. So the last recommendation, the council approved the ability for residents or organizations to pay into a fund for traffic mitigation with the ultimate installation location based on priority list. So any further discussion on this? Uh, Deputy Mayor. So I, you know, I, I've heard a couple comments from people didn't want to support that because they, they thought they could pay enough back. It talks about organizations too. You have organizations in this community, like the Lions and mm -hmm. other uh, organizations within this community, um, Knights of Columbus, things like that. That they do fundraise. They do go fundraise. And they do things like that. And this is this is something that they could they could put uh, good money to. I know we've had uh, our Lions Club support our Hennessy Park. They've supported uh, the community center. So there's areas that these these uh, we've had calls actually from the Lions asking what can they do to support our community. So. When it's an organization, I, I see residents or organizations 
So I'm not sure how many residents would give this. They'll first take a look at this. But the organizations are the ones that I thought are the big ones. We have a business, a business community. You know, a BIA maybe one day is here. We, we have that organization want to donate to something, traffic mitigation downtown. We don't know. But I, I, I would hate to see this go to wayside when we haven't even had a chance to explore it yet. So please think about that and, and remember that it's organizations that we might want to uh, uh, see and, and get some investment from that. Good point. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Orr? Well, when I first read uh, read this one, I was going over it. I, I was a little concerned, but um, I don't have a problem with this, based on the fact that people realize what the prior, what the parameters are, where the money is going. Uh, and I agree with the deputy mayor. I think a, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of residents would uh, probably uh, might back away from this based on the fact that it's going into. It wouldn't be going on their street. They're, they're, that's probably why a lot of residents would want to, to uh, put money in for their street. But uh, as the deputy mayor said, if there's other uh, organizations, whatever, that want to put money into this to help, and the people that are on the street want to put money into this for, for possibly their street someday, uh, then I don't have a problem with that. Okay, Council Scott? Just very briefly, I, if this was about organizations making donations we already have organizations ability to donate to the town we've already had uh, developers ask for speed bumps as part of their development applications this is in response to residents asking for the ability to pay to play for the service they think their street needs and this isn't actually what the motion will deliver it so for the queue jumping factor and the fact that it's not actually queue jumping and wouldn't achieve what the desired intention of the residents who asked for this is I'm I'm against it for two almost contradictory reasons because the recommendation itself is somewhat contradictory. Pastor Sandy. Thank you, Your Worship. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. They have the ability to donate now. We had, uh, you know, run for Bradford donating to the library. There was nothing stopping them. We have, we, they can donate now. My only concern is exactly what Councillor Scott said. I don't want the residents of Blue Dash to think that by passing this, they're gonna go around and, and raise some funds and those funds are going for the speed bump or any other mitigation on Blue Dash. That's, that's my concern because the way the report is coming, I, I think that's what uh, people are thinking that you raise the funds and then you can get your stuff done. And I'm, I'm not in favor of that. If we can clarify that and say that's not it, it's a general fund that uh, organizations or, or even residents can donate to town and they can say my funds can only go to traffic uh, mitigation uh, items, we have that ability now. Okay, any other comments? Good discussion? That, uh, um, I am siding with Councillor Scott. I think that, that the perception is out there that, that this money will go to a, a, an individual uh, neighborhood. And uh, uh, as council, we have to look at the whole whole town and the whole uh, flow of traffic. But saying that, we'll call for the vote now. So um, all those in favor of the recommendation as it's written. So that's four. So those against the, uh, the final clause. So it is a tie vote. So that means that it's defeated. <laughs> but, uh, so that, uh, we'll move on from there and, and that uh, Everybody in our community has an opportunity to uh, send comments to uh, uh, staff, to members of council, to uh, try and get uh, speed mitigation. And I think that uh, cameras, when they come into uh, force, that, that that'll be a great opportunity. And some of the uh, higher volume streets uh, will be uh, uh, top of the line for some of the uh, uh, speed cameras that we're able to put out. <coughs> 
With that, we'll move on to item 12.4, Report of Community Services, Taylor Park Award. Recommendation that report COM 2022-32 dated August 2nd, 2023, entitled Taylor Park Award is received and the council approved a revised total budget of $831,835 for the Taylor Park Project to be funded with $400,000 from the town's capital replacement reserve, $265,000 of grant funding and $175,000 from the town cash and room parts on that reserve fund. So a mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Sandu, comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Scott? Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to ask Terry Foran to speak to this as well, but uh, I'll just comment. We approved most of this uh, already. Uh, we approved half of it in the budget and then out of the blue, we were awarded a federal grant of about a quarter of a million dollars for phase two. So we moved it up. And last month, we were celebrating a project that came in $180,000 under budget. This month, we have a project that's $170,000 over budget. But I think the good news is our treasurer is letting us use the cash in lieu of parkland fund from developers to cover the shortfall, which is something Councillor Dykey asked about about a year ago uh, to take care of the older end of town's parks where there's infill development like Taylor Park, Lions Park, or Luxury Park. So the fact that we're getting to do that, I think is a big win, but I, I wanted to invite Terry to speak to the history of this because we've kind of had a series of happy occurrences that have moved this uh, further up the timeline and uh, we're able to get shovels in the ground this summer as a result. Terry? Thank you, Mayor Gufford and to Councillor Scott. Um, yeah, this, one, uh, this project has evolved a little bit over time. Um, with the development of the county housing at 125 Simcoe, um, we had to focus on relocation of the tennis courts which would be affected by it. Now, Taylor Park is um, a park that has its, has had its programming change over the last five years with the development of Henderson Park. So we were able to ship a lot of those soccer programs out of there, and it was uh, really key to uh, start looking at revitalization of that park uh, for the amenities that that neighborhood requires. Um, so it made for a perfect location for the tennis courts relocated there. Um, through that time, though, um, an opportunity for grant came up. Uh, we applied for the high-level um, opportunity. While we're in the detailed design and tender phase of the tennis courts, uh, which you see in, in, within the report here. Um, so through that period of time, we had an opportunity to apply for the grant. Uh, it was tailor-made what we were trying to do with it. Uh, and then in the interim, while we were through the tender process on the first uh, portion of the park, uh, we were notified that we became successful on the second part of the park. Um, within that period of time, we then got notification that we were over budget on our tender award by $40,000 on the tent courts. So we decided to extend tender as one overall project. And that's how this is now developed. Uh, and just with the consequences of time, um, prices have gone a little bit further past where we anticipated, uh, utilizing the numbers that we had historically uh, for building these types of parks. Um, so that's really the report that you're seeing in front of me today. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, Councilor Dyke. Well, I'm glad to see number one. This is parks uh, been there quite a while, and uh, with the, the growth uh, south of State's Line, you know you can almost call this is closer to a center of town right now. This was the outskirts of, of Bradford, but now with so much development happening in the, uh, by the uh, development community south of State's Line, this is a great location of park. I'm glad to see that the numbers, the, the grant came through, and we can get money from the, you know from cash and loo and, and, and be put back into the park because all these parks. Um, you look at these older parts of town, and uh, you look at the, uh, the new parks through uh, many years of, uh, of uh, improvements to the higher standards for the new developers that have to do in parks. And some of these parks, in Luxury Park, I'll say will be the next one to, to move forward. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, that's an older park of town, just like Taylor Park, and what, what was there before, and what's going to come forward is going to be a real improvement for the neighborhoods. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I did a great job, Terry and your staff, and uh, and Jonathan. I know he has something to do with it. He's in the background here, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm glad to see this move forward, and I'm looking for a future council to deal with Luxury Park because it's another park uh, highly used now, and it could be an upgrading with some some kind of uh, splash pads. Or we've seen a concept, but there's the residents want to get involved and have some more input to what what you proposed. To, I guess. Um, Couple of months ago or six months ago, but 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 great 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 job on this uh, Taylor Park. So thanks, Terry. Yeah. <coughs> Other comments? 
With that, I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor of the recommendation? And it is carried. Item 12.5, Report of Development and Engineering Services, Bill 109, More Homes for Everyone Act, 2022, and Provincial Changes to the Planning Act. So the recommendation is that report PES 2022-50, entitled Bill 109, More Homes for Everyone Act, 2022, Provincial Changes to the Planning Act, be received, and that staff review the town's delegation of approval authority by law 2010-013 and site plan control area by law 2010-012 as amended and report back to council with recommendations of any modifications required thereto as a result of changes to land use planning legislation or policy example bill 109. So moving to second or fourth <coughs> council Conantois, council Scott comments and questions so we do have Alan Weave uh, joining us remotely to uh, answer any questions. meet that goal. That's the province's goal. Amended planning and commercial use and development policies to support full spectrum of housing and intensification. So we're talking about intensification. Well, we're dealing with a couple of reports in this uh, night later on where we're talking about intensifying a lot of our uh, uh, green belt area and a lot of our, uh, our uh, urban area now with higher intensification numbers. So we're trying to meet some of this. The right, as of, uh, as of right, so permit for secondary suites, garden suites, as of right, multi-tenant housing, province-wide, encourage, incentivize, municipalities to increase density. A lot of things in here that we're gonna have really a tough time meeting, especially when it comes down to dealing with the approval process within the 60-day window, the 90-day window, you know, the 60-day for, I think it's a site plan 90 for zoning. These are gonna be issues that we're gonna have to deal with. And I know Alan is reviewing the bylaw, he wants to review the, uh, the control bylaw and the uh, by about 2010, 2012, and 20, or 2010, 20, 2010, 0, 13, 0, 12. Uh, these bylaws certainly want to review. I certainly want to make sure when we review them, though, that um, the buck stops right here with council, right here with council. And, and I want to make sure that in the end, when we review these bylaws, that in there there is some clause that we can turn around as as mayor or whatever that he can turn around and and, and okay the site plan or whatever. Where where I really worry is if. Okay, we, we have a designated uh, Alan or whatever, a designated director of, of uh, planning. But if he becomes ill or somebody falls ill or whatever, we lose that, and and then maybe the CAO. You know what I mean? We got. I want some. I want some steps here to make sure that we're not going to lose any kind of fees or permits because we can't meet our mandate. So I, I really I look forward to the future uh, uh, reports that you're going to be writing, Alan, and uh, to see how we're going to deal with these time time frames that the uh, province have put on us because it is a it is a very tight time frame, so we're going to have to do a lot of belt tightening and a lot of ways to figure out how we're going to meet these mandates. Because if we don't, it costs us as residents, taxpayers, it costs us money. So I want to make sure there's there's falls in there that the uh, warning signs or whatever software that uh, uh, you know brings in certain things. I mean, I can get into more detail, but in the end, I think it's something that uh, Alan and, and uh, your staff and, and uh, the senior management have to look at to see how we're going to deal with planning processes and make sure that we meet those target dates. Is this is an important bill that uh, could cost all of us in the future. So that's all I have to say, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Council Scott. Thank you. Uh, Alan and the planning team and I and the Board of Trade actually had a meeting with the Toronto Region Board of Trade a few months ago as this act was being developed, and it was very helpful that they wanted the government to go even further. Uh, I have two related questions, Alan. Um, the first is can you speak to what used to be called transit-oriented communities and how that will affect the GO train station. And then second, relatedly, does our bus transit or the county's bus transit qualify as a transit route that would trigger some of the density as of right uh, along the Holland Street corridor, for instance? Alan?
specific terms used in, in the Planning Act and provincial policies of a similar uh, nature. I can hear you right now. I, I think it's on our end that we're having problems uh, picking up your sound. That, uh, so Chris is working on it here. So maybe try again, Alan, and see whether we can uh, hear you or not. Certainly, is this any better? Still mm -hmm. not. My apologies, I've uh, just changed my, my sound settings as well. Is this better? Turn your mic on. Hey, try that now, My apologies. Is this any better on uh, on your end, Your Worship? Yes, thank you. Uh, with respect to the transit-oriented communities piece, uh, there's two sections. Thank you, Alan. It, uh, Councilor Scott, is that uh, fine? So that uh, other comments and questions then. Councilor Sandu. Thank you, Your Worship. The way I understood from the report is that timeline we have of 60 days and 90 days starts from when the application is deemed completed. So if we're waiting for outside entity like a CA or, or some other organization, um, that does not, the 60 days don't count for that. It, it, it's still considered a waiting period or, or, or we get a hit on our fees waiting on the outside entity. So um, maybe you don't have an answer right now. Does the municipality have tools or, or is it allowed that we can then go back and, and charge back to those uh, entities, um, whether it's the county or the, or the CAs to recover those costs? The second point I want to add is, I, I agree, if say manager planning has the delegated authority for the site plans, um, if he or she is not available, then 
then it shouldn't wait. It should go to the director and then it goes CAO or so on and so forth. That needs to be captured somewhere. So we're not waiting for anyone as, as far as town staff is concerned or, or council is concerned. Because if that goes, the way this is written and you captured the report, we, we can lose lots of revenue, lots of fees based on someone else's actions. And, and we need to have some sort of a mechanism to recover that or if it's in house to get the work done in time. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Aura and then Councillor Lamb. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, now, when I went through the, uh, uh, through the, uh, uh, the whole process here, uh, just, it just concerns me that this is going to put a lot of pressure onto, especially communities outside of the general GTA, community like our own. And, and uh, I understand that we're, um, that our province is saying we need, uh, they feel we need this type of, of, uh, of building going on. Uh, but to put that on to a lot of communities like ourselves, they're basically with our uh, proximity to Toronto, um, we could we could have we could be asked to double in size, and if we, if that's the case, we that's huge amount of money for our town, and that puts it right on our taxpayer that's here now. That's what concerns me. So I I'm I'm very concerned in some of these issues that are that come up in this report. Council Lamb. Yes, uh, Alan. Uh, I'm concerned as well, uh, especially with this one, uh, restore the right of developers to appeal official plans and municipal comprehensive reviews, um, which means to me is that somebody would come along and buy, buy something and decide that they want to jump outside the official plan urban boundary and uh, go to LPAT or, or whoever or MZ uh, MZO and Ministerial Zoning Order, and uh, uh, then why are we why are we doing what we're doing to try to protect uh, the different types of, uh, of activities and uh, land uses in our municipality, urban farm uh, and uh, and uh, environmental. So uh, that I really have that concern with that line in there. Restore the right of developers to appeal. Okay, Councillor Dykey, and then I'll turn it to Alan for just final comments. Yeah, as uh, Councillor Lamb mentioned, uh, I, I concur with him as well. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I I like to see the the facts things speeded up to a, to a certain degree, but I sure don't want to see the um, the taxpayers uh, burden uh, with all this. Uh, they need more staff, need more there's traffic and and so forth and so forth. Yeah, yes, uh, quicker homes. Uh, and more alternative uh, homes, uh, different, different, um, different items, different home, uh, homes outside the, the box. Like you know, as uh, Deputy Mayor mentioned, you know, uh, garden suites and this and that. But at the end of the day, you know, this has to be managed. And and, and I have a little bit, I have some concerns with it. Uh, uh, what, how this is going to unfold? But uh, it just makes me, you know, I'm in favor. But on the other hand, I, I can see some problems with this document. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Dakey. So, um, Alan, just if you could comment about uh, uh, how many of these uh, changes have been put into place and some of them possibly might or might not be put into place in the future, and uh, just that uh, your general comments. Uh, with respect to the delegation of authority piece, uh, the town's current delegation of authority bylaw includes the opportunity for a designated uh, alternate in, in lieu of the, uh, the, the lead planner. Uh, and so in the event of absence, uh, there is that built-in opportunity uh, for a, a staff level approval to be issued. Under the current delegation of authority bylaw from 2010, uh, there are uh, some forms of site plan approval for which uh, council has retained the authority to approve. 
Uh, those would generally include um, commercial retail developments along a major arterial county or provincial road, uh, multi-unit residential developments similar to the Holland House proposal that's recently gone forward and so forth. Uh, under the new Planning Act, uh, under Bill 109, authority to approve those um, under the Planning Act would have to be uh, delegated to uh, an officer, employee, or agent. Uh, with respect to the matter of, of refunding fees, uh, staff have been meeting with uh, our counterparts in other jurisdictions within the Simcoe sub area and beyond. Uh, and we've been putting our minds and thoughts together as to how to ensure that um, that our municipalities are able to retain 100% of the fees that we receive. Uh, those include looking at ways to ensure that structurally our processes fit within uh, prescribed timelines and, and if and where they don't uh, to look at, uh, at potential opportunities for sit for uh, I'll call them fail-safe measures, uh, such that we, we enable that milestone to be reached, uh, for instance, possibly with conditions. Uh, we, are, we are working um, very seriously to, uh, to mitigate the potential effects of, of Bill 109 in those areas. Uh, regarding the other changes from the Housing Affordability Task Force's report, uh, so as, as indicated, um, there were 55 recommendations, uh, some of which uh, have made their way uh, into changes to the Planning Act that have been enacted by Bill 109. Uh, others have not, uh, and uh, we'll certainly um, be mindful of, uh, of what new changes may be proposed through the Environmental Registry of Ontario, and we will report back to Council with any further updates of, of new changes that would implement those recommendations. Okay, so thank you, Alan. And our IT team uh, did an excellent job. You were coming in loud and clear. We've got the uh, bugs out of the uh, uh, audio system. So we were pretty sure that it would be hard to you know, run completely a, a full council meeting without any bugs. But uh, if that's the most serious one we've had, we've done, done a pretty good job. So thanks, Chris. So any other questions or comments before uh, I call for the vote on this recommendation? Seeing none, then. All those in favor? And it is carried. So thank you, Alan. And uh, yeah, sounds like you're on top of it and you're talking to our neighboring municipalities to see how we can uh, mitigate any financial stress that we uh, might see moving forward. So with that, we'll move on to item 12.6, Report of Development and Engineering Services, proposed amendments to sign bylaw 2011-23. So the recommendation is that report DES 2022-39 entitled Proposed Amendments to Signed Bylaw 2011-23 be received and the Council approve the amendments to Signed Bylaw 2011-23. Move and a seconder for this. Sorry. Councillor Orr, Councillor Dykey, comments or questions? So we have our Chief Building Official Willie here. So, Councillor Dykey. Well, I, I read the report, uh, actually I read, I read the email from Deputy Mayor to, to Willie, and, and, and I know you went out to, uh, to uh, um, E-Signs, and uh, well, so it was a, a little, yeah, uh, Barry Snapper in the game. I would have just hoped uh, that this bylaw would have went to, uh, like, like I'm going back in the past, it would have had maybe an uh, open session for the Business, the business community as well as the BBT, more people would have had an opportunity to kick at that cat. You know, I know you want the two two people to do business, but there's other firms are uh, in the in, in the industry that I would have liked to hear uh, hear back from you. You know, I, I know you're an expert in in, in this building uh, field, but uh, I just wish there was a bit more public input because when our Jance days, um, there were so many people at the table and had in input, and I just hope that we don't miss. Anything in this bylaw? Those are my comments. Uh, Deputy Arlandy. Yes, thank you, Worship. And uh, I, I know what Peter, uh, uh, Councilor Becky is going after, and it, this is just a review yeah. of what we're looking at now because we've had so many variances come to us. It's about the new the new sign. Uh, this is an extensive bylaw. I remember when we first uh, did the bylaw, and if I go back to that table, somewhere in 2010, I think. Uh, Council Condor and I were on that committee and we designed that first signed bylaw for our community. So uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, I 
was what he was trying to get after was was uh, let's get the, some of the variance out of the way. He understands that uh, there is change to be made to this bylaw in the future, and we will certainly at that time go out to the public and, and invite much, many more people into the into the system. But I think what we did is we we went out to the two people that uh, knew the knew the bylaw already because Gary uh, Bricker was on that committee also. Uh, Mark Snapper now being the new uh, new digital sign of, of, of person out there, we, we decided that those were two. Or I think Willie decided that was two people that he could actually get some good data from it and, and, and help us maybe a lot of the variances that he has to bring to us where he just needed some structure from them to see what was going to work so that he, his team could work together and, and uh, address these sign issues. So I, I really appreciate that, Willie, because the council, remember, we were dealing with these variances. We were asking Willie, how come we have to do with these variances? He went out and did his homework and, and uh, got us a new bylaw that has a few amendments, but in his report, it talked about him reviewing the whole bylaw in the future and making sure that we bring it up to speed for our community. Really, when we get into redesigning the downtown the road, the Hall Street, we're going to want to maybe look at that sign bylaw. We're going to want to have some new recommendations for that, and especially right downtown for me. We're going to fix special areas that community. We want to have some special signage and things like that that are going to work for the future. So I think this tonight hits it, uh, hits what we wanted to hit, and that was to reduce our variances at this point in time until we get to the uh, redevelopment of downtown and, and looking at the other big pictures within our community. So uh, thank you, William. Thank you for, uh, for what you did. And you, uh, I, I mean, I hit you with an email anytime, and you're you're right on top of it. And I really appreciate that because, uh, I mean, we're on a long weekend, and it's, I think, on a Sunday, and they're really uh, replying to a, an email that we asked for, or I asked a question that I didn't expect till maybe today. So again, thank you for, uh, for doing that. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think uh, Council would like to keep a good plan. Yeah, on the next around large scale amendment, we are planning to uh, call the public meeting to get the input from the residents as well as the side industry. But this, just like Deputy Mayor said, we just respond to the Council's request during those various bodies to the Council the last couple of years. Particular is the respect to the electronic sign, uh, the number of the first party sign, uh, the maximum area of the sign permitted to particular property. I think that's what the report addressed to. Yes, in the future, the council request, certainly we do a large scale uh, amendment to involve the public. Also, we may get a legal outside consulting. Okay, to make sure the bylaw is right and everything. Okay. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Uh, Councillor Sandu and then I'll go back to Councillor Jacob. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Willie, for this report. Um, I know Council asked you for this. It's not the whole sign bylaw review. Um, for section 4.3, the security deposit. Um, maybe not this maybe for the other when we review the full bylaw that we have to look at timeline to refund the deposit <coughs> i had personally been involved with with uh, three or four where people were waiting for a long time and it was um it was for valid reasons that they didn't get but you know we need to have some sort of a mechanism say either to get back to them and say why their deposit is being held or what the holdup is, or have some sort of a timeline saying once the work is done, within this time frame, the inspection has to happen and after the inspection is passed, everything is good, within this time frame that they need to get their refund. They shouldn't have to wait five, six months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sandu. Maybe over to you, Willie, just to comment about the... the uh... Yeah, I think... Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Sandu. I think, I think you're talking about the building bylaw, the security, uh, not the uh, side bylaw security. I think what happened is the building bylaw, okay, uh, before we release the uh, security permit for homeowner project, particularly like swimming fence uh, enclosure, the infill lot, the decking. I think sometimes they may use the wrong allowance. They may damage the public property. So that's why we want to wait for uh, the uh, other department to look at, particularly the uh, road department. I think uh, uh, Rebecca will have a meeting tomorrow. 
part of our process. So what we're going to probably propose when they apply for a building permit, uh, particular homeowner for infill lot, we may have a supplementary form, ask them to declare, do they use the road allowance or not? If they yes, then we have to send them to the transportation, <coughs> transportation department to get the uh, road allowance, uh, road occupant permit before we, uh, we uh, allow them to attack the building permit application. Uh, that's why they want to be delayed in some time, particularly winter time. Okay, that means they cannot look at the road, so they have to wait until the weather getting better. But for this side, security is no problem. Right? They just expect it, they release it. Okay, there would be no delay for the security on the side permit. Thank you, Willie. Really. I was speaking in general. Wherever we take the security deposit from any of the residents, when the work is done, there has to be a timeline that within this time frame, after inspections passed, you will get your refund. I agree with you 100%. I think the homeowner, I mean, they, <laughs> they need the money, okay? So we lose it. Yeah. We could look into it. I'm certain they have uh, room for improvement. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Willie. And, and it does say, in addition, and if applicable, every application shall provide a security deposit. So I hope that that doesn't mean every application needs a security deposit if it doesn't uh, affect the road allowance or whatever. Like, oh. there seems to be discretion there. And I think maybe that's what Councillor Sandy for for a sign uh, uh, permit. So that, uh, yeah. You could look into that, anyways. What what is applicable and what isn't, and, and uh, move forward. Because uh, unless members of council go for a building permit, we really don't understand the the, yeah, <laughs> the process yeah. until we get a, an email from, from a resident. So uh, if that can be looked at. So other comments, uh, Councilor Dyke. Well, with the whole, the whole bylaw, I think uh, as we reconstruct Holland Street, there's a good opportunity to uh, really look at. Our, our quality of science in this in, in our town. You know, the, I had a good chat with uh, with e science uh, Gary Burkle, and and the knowledge and the ideas he has some great ideas. Now I don't know how you enforce it or how you get uh, buy-in from different businesses, but but if you do the, some kind of uniform standard down the road, it could really help beautify this uh, this town, and, uh, and and just the whole concept, uh, the good good guidelines. And a good report, really. You know, and I thank you for for your great work, and I'm very impressed how you answered the deputy mayor's uh, um, email so quick on the Sunday. But at the end of the end of the day, we move forward, and but there's great opportunity for us to uh, to improve our signage in, in in our town as we move forward. Okay. Hey, any other comments, questions? With that, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? In this case. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. So, next item is 12.7 Report of Development and Engineering Service Recommendation Report for Proposed Telecommunications Tower. The owner, James and Joyce Muirhead, I, unfortunately, it's the estate, I imagine, of James and Joyce Muirhead. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Muirhead passed away uh, probably after this uh, started the process. Anyways, the applicant is Forbes Brothers Limited, care of Sean Ogilvy. The location is 3568 line 4, file number D142107. The recommendation is the report DS 2022-45, entitled Recommendation Report for Proposed Telecommunications Tower 3568 line 11. We received as a council advised innovation, science, and economic development Canada via Forbes Brothers Limited that they concur with the proposal to install a telecommunications tower property. Municipally known as 3568 line 4. Comments and questions? That, uh, it went through the process and, and no uh, complaints from the neighborhood and with cell service and uh, so much demand. That, uh, so, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Uh, I don't think we get a or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Orr moves it, and Councillor Lamb seconds it. So 
So I'll call for the vote again. All those in favor? And it is carried. So item 12.8, Report of Development and Engineering Services, Recommendation Report, Official Plan Review, Supplementary Modifications. <coughs> so, the recommendation is that report DES 2022-46, entitled Official Plan Review, Supplementary Modifications, be received, that Council endorse the modifications to the March 2021 Adopted official plan for Bradford West Will and Brave pursuant to the recommendations in report number DES 2022-46 and the staff implement the modifications to the March 2021 adopted official plan and issue an update, updated and final version there of to the county assembly for review and approval. So I'm moving a seconder for this. And on the floor, Deputy Mayor LeDuc and Councillor Sandy. Comments or questions? Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, I was, I was going to comment that I'd like to defer this for tonight. Uh, there is, it's a large report. We've got a large agenda in front of us, and I was hoping that we could probably defer this for tonight and move it to a... I, I do want to finish this. I think we need to finish our OP eventually uh, this term. I want that... A lot of comments came back from, uh, from the county and everybody else, and uh, it's a large, it's 266 pages, this alone, so uh, it's quite an in-depth report. We wanted to make sure that we uh, go through it. Uh, we've got some more uh, comments that we can tweak in here, you know, we can add some more stuff to it now that we've seen some of the other comments. So I think it's, uh, it's a comment upon us. The best thing for us to do is just to uh, defer this for tonight and, and uh, move it to another agenda when we have a little smaller or, or even just a special meeting to do this for ourselves uh, in the future. I'm asking for the Okay, through process, I, I I would like different members of council just to make a few comments before we get a seconder for the deferral. To is that is it a referral or a deferral? One you can uh, have comments and one you can't. So uh, I'll look to our clerk's table. I can pull that from the floor if you'd like. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we'll allow the deputy mayor to pull his uh, uh, request, and, and we'll just go go around the table just to get a few comments. So, uh, Councilor Day, this is quite a, a process, and it has been um, since it gets to go back to 2016. Um, I, I just feel that uh, I feel we should have a, a workshop, a special meeting to deal with this. Has the biggest impact in our municipality. Um, and I think that we should bring in more as uh, some of your experts to dialogue, talk to us, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's quite a report to read and to digest. And uh, you know, the, it's, it's it's a big report, and I, I feel it's, it's one of the most important uh, documents that we have in the future of the municipality. And I think too, we should take a second and, and, and have a look at it so, and, and workshop. So however we can deal with that's my feeling. Okay, thanks, Councilor Becky. Other comments, questions? Just the, <coughs> going through the report, and, and the County of Simcoe really made an awful lot of changes. I was quite surprised that they, they yeah. put so many changes into our official plan, mm -hmm. and they're able to do that without a public meeting. And that yeah. sort of surprised me, as well as comments from the uh, Conservation Authority and Ministry of Transportation and that. And, uh, I just felt that uh, uh, there's maybe opportunities for us to be able to tweak our official plan, to, to be able to uh, do what the Ministry of Transportation wants, to do what the official government wants as far as uh, second suites or alternate, um, and another name for uh, uh, other numbers of uh, uh, dwelling units on a property and, and things like that, but uh, whether there would be uh, some opportunity to, to uh, make uh, a, a few changes. And I know, Councillor Orr, when we were at the Heritage Committee, there was a, a, you know, a recommendation that we could uh, ask in our official plan to be able to allow designated heritage properties on uh, agricultural land to uh, be allowed to be severed. It's similar to uh, a severance for uh, an expanding farm and a surplus dwelling. 
this would be uh, like a, a designated property that would be a surface dwelling that uh, could be uh, uh, severed as well. And, and that goes with the, 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 the feeling of, of uh, more homes, more choices. And it just, it, it's a shame to have uh, houses being demolished because people buy the property and they don't want to uh, have tenants, they don't want to be landlords. And yet these properties, these houses are, are you know, some of them are, are wonderful uh, estate homes almost, and yet they're, they're being demolished because uh, the owners don't want to uh, be landlords. So there's an opportunity to save some land or save some homes, you know, one home saved it is one less home to be built on uh, prime agricultural land. So that the, it, there's some, some things that uh, we could, uh, I think, uh, put into our own official plan that we see whether the, the county and then the province would, would allow to move forward. Councillor Orr, comment? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, no, thank you for bringing that forward because I, I think it is key for uh, saving some of our homes that uh, we, we have some homes in this uh, town that, uh, especially in the rural areas, that um, they are either designated or designatable that uh, no one living in them, they're deteriorating uh, where they could be severed off. And I, I think that that's something that hopefully we can incorporate or ask in our official plan or send that to the county and the province. But um, I, I agree with the deputy mayor right, uh, as far as uh, uh, putting this onto a, a separate meeting or to a, a I think this, this is a, a very important that we get this right. And uh, this is a, a massive, uh, um, a massive amount of, of information that's come back uh, other than what we sent uh, out for our official plan. And uh, I'd like to see more time. Uh, definitely want to see this done but, uh, or put to bed for, uh, for this term of council, but I, I'd like to uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, within the, the time frame in, in the next month or so that we can have the time to go over this more diligently. Diligent. Councilor Lamb. I agree. Um, seeing as we just discussed the More Homes Act, uh, I think we need to firm up our uh, official plan uh, so that we, uh, we firm up our document uh, so that we it still be masters of where we put things and, and protect the rest of the, of the municipality. As I don't want any leapfrogging out there. Uh, we're some, you know, because a lot of these farms out there are owned by developers now and uh, they don't necessarily want to be the uh, wait wait for, the, for uh, the town to fill in. So I'm concerned. We need to build the walls. And so we need to review it. I maybe we'll ask our CAO just to comment about uh, the process, and, and we have uh, Madam Masudi who wrote the report, and, and an excellent report. The way that it was uh, uh, laid out, the the, you know, the changes that were re requested by the different uh, uh, levels of government. Thank you for the report. But uh, Jeff, is there any uh, comment about moving forward? Could it come back in a September uh, council meeting? Sure. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, th this step of the approval process was uh, certainly part of the overall program and anticipated. With the County of Simcoe as the approval authority for the local official plans, um, they've taken their time to review the document that Council adopted several months ago now. Uh, they've continued to receive comments from property owners, from uh, residents, uh, and from agencies like school boards, and the Conservation Authority, uh, provincial ministries. Um, and so they've synth synthesized all that and made a number of modifications to the report. Now, they didn't necessarily have to take this step where they sent it back to, to our council to review, but it is a good practice. So that's why it's in front of you tonight. Um, what they anticipated is that tonight or at some point, council will, will pass uh, a resolution similar to what you have in front of you that essentially uh, at the least acknowledges the modifications the county has proposed. Um, our, our planning team have uh, 
recommended some additional modifications um, through the ongoing uh, consultation that we've been carrying out as well, uh, and some further tweaks that uh, they noticed as being appropriate. So uh, the, the culmination of that is the report that's in front of you. It is a lot. We certainly appreciate that. There was a, a lot to absorb this evening. And uh, certainly if you want to take some more time, uh, there's no issue with that uh, whatsoever. Um, I'll uh, speak further with, with the clerk and our planning team and the mayor as to when to best schedule that. Uh, perhaps it will be a special meeting as uh, I think our forthcoming objectives are, but uh, we can certainly accommodate uh, another session to come to discuss this in more detail. Okay, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> and your I, I, it was a great report, man. Trust me, I, I did read a lot of it. I did read the, the 260, and we've been through it enough times. But there is a lot to digest, and I was of the belief I, I, I really want to make sure I get it right from from our point of view. I want to make sure that it's done right. I want, I want to digest the county's uh, comments, and I want to digest the CAs. So I, I, I asked just defer, and I, I, I leave it up to our CAO. I mean, uh, he can sit with the mayor, and we can have some chats about um, when to bring it back. But uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. Late August, September, I, I, whatever we, uh, whatever is decided, we, it is a big one. I'd like to make sure that we have it. You brought up a great point. I mean, we missed a couple of days. We think we can tighten up and, uh, and, and incorporate some of this uh, places, uh, more homes, more choices. So, so to look this over, review it. I, I prefer to do that. So a deferral is what I'm suggesting on the table. Okay, moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Leduc. Deferral, a seconder for that. Uh, Council Sandu. Call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? It is good. Okay, so we'll move on to item 12.9, Record of Development and Engineering Services. Request for subdivision agreement holding and holding provision removal. And the owner's applicant is Brad Beast Development Incorporated, location block 170 on plan of subdivision at 51 AM 1137, file number D14-2118. D12 2015. So the recommendation is that report DES 2022-48 entitled Request for Subdivision Agreement and Hold Removal for Block 170 on Plan of Subdivision 51M1137 be received, that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute the subdivision agreement once finalized, and the Council pass a bylaw to remove the holding H6 symbol for the development of five development blocks in Block 170 on plan 51M1137 that will come in a force and effect once the subdivision agreement has been executed, final approval has been issued, and the plan of subdivision has been registered. A mover and a seconder for this. Council Lamb, Deputy Mayor Ledoux. Comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is Item 1210, Report of Development and Engineering Services, County of Central Municipal Comprehensive Review, Project Update Number 3. So the recommendation is that Report DES 2021-51, entitled County of Central Municipal Comprehensive Review, Project Update Number 3, be received at Council Direct Staff provide comments to the County of Central on the draft growth management Central County official plan amendment in regards to employment land policies, designated greenfield area policies, intensification targets, and major transit station area policies as outlined in section 3.3.14 of report DDS 2021-51 and that further to the recommended comments involved in the comments previously submitted as part of the resolution 2021-262 Resolution COW 2021-99. Council provide any additional comments to your separate resolution. So a mover and a seconder for this. Council Dyke, Deputy Mayor Leduc. Comments and questions. So again, the county's going through the municipal comprehensive review. They've come out with the uh, Population numbers, growth management targets, densification, employment land policies, and that uh, 
some of them are quite uh, ambitious, I guess I could say. <laughs> so we have a, a report here. So I'll open it up to council members for comment. Thank you, Richard. And it's, uh, yeah, it's an ambitious target that uh, the county has picked uh, with us seeing uh, 39,000 population and looking at 440 some hectares of land they're looking to uh, expand our boundary by. Uh, no, it's a, it's a, a pretty profile, and I, I look forward to seeing the county's replies. I guess so. What, what I'm interested in hearing is, is replies from the county on, on what Alan has asked in this report. So um, some of the targets are pretty tough. Uh, we've sent recommendations already in, resolutions already in, based on some of the issues. So uh, all they can say is I look forward to the county's reply, in a sense, to Alan's uh, request for information for he's asking for some more info. So just, uh, I think in the end, if we, if we get a small resolution at the end, it just says that we're, we're uh, looking for a, a feedback from the county, a reply to Alan's request. We draft some resolution to say that. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Alan, do you want to comment about uh, um, will the county respond to to uh, this uh, recommendation, or how do you see this proceeding? Excuse me, thank you, Your Worship. Based on a published work plan that the county that county staff have issued on their municipal comprehensive review webpage, uh, we anticipate that county staff will continue to target a report to County Council in August uh, on the draft growth management Simcoe County official plan amendment. Um, and so the, the timeline between publication of the draft growth management OPA and, uh, and that target recommendation is rather condensed, uh, but we are hopeful that we can still have additional comments considered. Um, I did have a discussion with uh, with Nathan Westendorf, the director of, of planning at the county, uh, I believe the last week, and, uh, and we did discuss the the very points that uh, that staff were working on presenting to council this evening. So that uh, it was uh, somewhat of a, of a courtesy update of of where our staff level review had landed up to that point. Um, certainly through this report, uh, we aimed to provide uh, technical feedback. Uh, particularly in the areas of the intensification targets and the designated greenfield area density targets, uh, since that is an area that we anticipate uh, getting into with greater depth through a local uh, growth management update to the town's official plan, which would then project out to 2051, um, and to, to afford the community a chance to to review and consider scenarios that would explore different densities and intensification targets. Uh, but um, we have had the chance to review uh, some of the county's data uh, and to provide feedback. And through that, uh, town staff did observe that the population figures uh, that the county has put together have come down a little bit. The additional designated greenfield area that the county anticipates requiring for that additional population has also come down a little bit. And the jobs numbers have gone up. Uh, as well, county, uh, the county MCR work has, has now recognized uh, and, and identified the need for the Highway 400 employment reserve lands to be brought online within the 2051 horizon as part of accommodating uh, the town of BWG's forecasted employment growth. Um, so we, we don't currently anticipate another round of, of, uh, of review and feedback uh, on more granular data. Um, we do understand that the county staff continues to target their work plan to report to county council in August. Okay, thank you, Alan, for that update. So, but uh, um, other comments, uh, Councilor Scott. Thank you, Your Worship. There's a lot in here, and I think with our official plan review being deferred, some of that will overlap, and we can have that more thorough discussion about our official plan and the implications from the MCR then. So I wanted to make a bit more of a fundamental and foundational comment. The direction that the county is pushing is that Bradford and Innisfil will exacerbate our situation as the largest population centers. Bradford already is the largest population center. We're certainly the most diverse community. And between us and Innisfil and New Tecumseh, we're 
the cash cow of the entire county. And mindful that I'm saying this from within the library, which has been the latest flashpoint, the county needs to get it through their heads that they have a north-south divide that their behavior is exacerbating. And it should be incumbent on them as a level of government to treat other levels of government with respect and work together and get along rather than constantly poking their largest urban centers, their most diverse populations, and their cash cows in the eye. And the MCR is yet again making it clear that the county's intention is to have an urban south and a beautiful, more rural cottage country. I was up there this weekend, north. And that's fine. They just have to account for it and their staff have to accommodate it by being accommodating and being reasonable and working collaboratively rather than being offended when you point out that an urban center is different than tiny township. That's all we're asking for is to recognize that Bradford differs from tiny township and it requires accommodation and if, if the county isn't prepared to realize that we're going to continue to have the same sorts of fights that are completely unnecessary because all we're asking for is to be treated fairly and equitably based on our unique situations vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the county. Bradford and Innisville right now is about a quarter of the county's population and close to about the same in economic uh, base and, and so that needs to be a separate mindset change up at the county as part of their MCR. They're requiring us to continue to do this so they have to have a plan to deal with it professionally. Okay, thank you Councillor Scott. Other comments? Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just in regards to Alice's comments about the employment lands and bringing it into online for 2051, Alan, I just want to know, uh, the county, obviously, they put in there to be supportive of that, but uh, I want to make sure that, the, and, and that's why I asked for the county's reply, I want to make sure that uh, Nathan understands that we want the same, we want the same principles that uh, they have for Innisfil and Oro Medante when it comes to their employment centers. We want to make sure that we can have those same kind of uh, uh, leeway, in a sense, more flexibility in, in our planning process for our, our employment line. So I just want to make sure, did, does the county recognize that? Uh, so have you asked that question to, to see if we can have that? I know it's in your report here. Did you ask, did you get to ask Nathan that question uh, directly? Alan? Thank you, Richard. Through you to Deputy Mayor Leduc. My apologies. <clears throat> Uh, yes, yes, we did have that discussion very, very pointedly on um, the distinction in the, the policy framework that applies to BWG's employment lens relative to Innisfil's and uh, Oro Medanta's. Um, the Director of Planning at the County is aware of those distinctions. Uh, and, uh, and, and there is also the, the recognition there that in order to bring the Highway 400 reserve lands online uh, would require uh, an additional policy directive or a, a revised policy directive from the Minister of Infrastructure. Through that process, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, as prescribed under the growth plan, does have the ability to refine boundaries and use permissions uh, as articulated in the policy directive. Uh, and that's where uh, one of the additional recommendations uh, has come from that Currently, the, the county's official plan refers to a very specific policy directive from 2012, uh, whereas because the under the growth plan, the minister is able to refine boundaries and use permissions thereafter, uh, it's suggested that uh, some flexibility be built into the county official plan to account for, for future uh, policy directives from the minister, if they so chose. Thank you, Alan. Council uh, Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, yeah, Alan, uh, I found this document very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, they, in the document, it states that we need, like, I forget what it was, it was 47 Holland Hosses to meet the demands of, of, uh, of the province and, and the county uh, for those higher densities. Uh, and the densities were pushed towards. Uh, in the proper places, in my view, uh, the GO station and transit sites along the main street, uh, which is perfect. But we have a concern. The, the lands that are by the GO station aren't designated. Uh, uh, those types of uh, buildings can't go on them. And, and, e and even uh, uh, 
even when we look at it, the, the soil samples, I, I believe there's, you have to do boring and, and things like that. We don't even know if it, it would hold such a structure. So how can they put onus on up to us saying you need to make sure that the high densities are into these volumes and, and areas uh, when there's uncertainties? And, and how do we combat that? Yeah. So I'll leave that to you. Alan, can you answer that? or I know it's a mouthful. So okay, thank you. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Collins' question, uh, we did have discussions with county staff about how to navigate that. And they reached out to us because they recognized that the Bradford Go station is very unique in the sense that it is, of course, flanked to the uh, immediate east uh, as well as to the southeast across Bridge Street uh, by lands that are within the, the Greenbelt plan area and not um, designated for development and therefore ineligible to be included within the major transit station area uh, density targets. And it was with that in mind, uh, along with the recognition of some of the floodplain boundaries, as you pointed out, Councillor Contois, that, that they approached us with um, the, the openness of considering a, a flexible policy framework as part of their growth management official plan amendment, one that would merely conceptually map the major transit station area boundary, excluding the Greenbelt plan area lands, and embed within a draft policy in their growth management official plan amendment uh, the opportunity for the town to refine that boundary through local consultation and analysis. Uh, and so the principle that I've understood they, they mean to apply is to recognize that not all lands within the 800 meter buffer of the Bradford Go station are, are created equal, so to speak, in terms of their development potential, but that as soon as you remove all the lands that are heavily constrained, uh, that diminishes the town's opportunity to pursue meaningful uh, intensification near the, the higher order transit. Uh, and they, they wanted to propose a framework whereby we, the town would not lose the opportunity for that land and for that density, uh, but by considering it in a, in a different way than, than currently intended in the growth plan. So they have, they have uh, expressed a, a willingness and desire to, to be flexible in that interpretation, uh, and to uh, to certainly look to the town for consultation to, to find out what the community's appetite is to to try to accommodate uh, a major transit station area. Thank you, Alan. Just to Councilor Kondra. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. And, and I guess my next question is like all through these documents, it, it basically talks about uh, transit and and uh, and the opportunities around transit. Um, my thing is. We've, we've, we're going through an expansion on the GO station right now as we speak, and, and the parking is not adequate now. Uh, and, and with the new spots that are being delivered, we might be adequate until 2031. But these intensification numbers, uh, are they going to do an expansion on the GO? Are they going to do another lay-by? Something needs to happen uh, in order to handle these type of numbers. So is there any discussion in that room? Certainly. Thank you, through your worship, to Councillor Kampas uh, for the question. Um, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, we've provided uh, Metro Links with the best available information that, that we've had access to uh, in terms of development proposals in the area around the GO station to inform uh, what kind of um, additional usership they can anticipate with, with greater intensification in the immediate area. Uh, unfortunately, that has not yet included, uh, sorry, that, those numbers have been based on the town's population forecast through to 2031. Um, those numbers have, and, and development proposals have not been informed by uh, the, town, the town's uh, residential planning needs to a horizon of 2051 in a way that would consider uh, where and to what extent the town may may wish to engage in increasing levels of, of density. Uh, so certainly uh, 
through the town's next growth management uh, official plan review, uh, we, we would indeed anticipate uh, engaging with Metro Links uh, to, to keep them involved in uh, how the growth management scenarios may develop uh, in a form that would be presented to the community. Uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, continue to circulate them on, on applications that are, are within proximity to, uh, to the Bradford Grove Station lands. Thank you, Alan, uh, and uh, I think what a lot of council members realize is that this growth costs an awful lot of money. Uh, it should be covered by development charges, but that, that's something that has to be <laughs> nailed down and made sure that uh, uh, growth pays for growth, and that uh, I'm not sure with the county's uh, uh, decision to split uh, the growth areas from South Simple and North Simple. And uh, North Simple communities could grow more. They have more land available for residential de development right now. And yet because the county's uh, consultant uh, said that the South needs the majority of growth, that means that the South needs to take more greenfield to be able to uh, turn it into residential. And, and, uh, Without a, a, a you know a similar understanding that the development charges that the growth in the south uh, realizes goes to pay for the growth in the south, is that I, I'm not sure. And this goes to Councillor Scott's comments that uh, uh, we have to uh, make the make the county aware that uh, growth costs and that the development charges doesn't have to pay for that growth. So. I'm not, uh, still not comfortable with the number of hectares of land they want uh, developed in, in uh, our municipality, and uh, <coughs> I'm just concerned about uh, how that will affect uh, our town moving forward. But, Councillor Dyke, your comments? Yeah. You know, when we talk about growth and growth and growth, official plan more and more and more in the county, uh, downloads all this pressure to, uh, to our town, and, and at the end of the day, we look at, the, uh, look at resources. You know, we all have been through uh, the pre-servicing plan, uh, going to get water, you know, to have enough water to, to provide all these all this lands. Hydro, I mean, I, I've never seen anyone talk about uh, hydro. You know, now we have more electric cars. The grid system that, that we have, has, like, who's going to pay for all this at the end of the day? So much time, do it faster, problems to do it faster, but how, you know, how do we, uh, how do we tie all this in? You know, you have to grow by this much. Uh, you know, we only have so much resources, so many roads. You know, yes, the 404 is gonna happen in, in the next uh, years to come, but, but it puts so much pressure on, on the existing uh, residents. The whole pro project is, is big and we, it has to be done right, but it's, it's very challenging how we have re evolved in the last four years. It's amazing. Okay, um, hey, so. We are concerned with the process. We're just wondering what, how, as far as the anticipation and density numbers, how that will affect our municipality. And in a way, we feel like we're losing some of the ability at the lower tier municipality to plan our future. This is, uh, that is you know, part of the province's uh, mandate that we have given to the upper tiers. But uh, I think that uh, there are concerns as far as that uh, goes. And uh, with the uh, the report on the official plan and that, I, I think it will give the council an opportunity to, to uh, go over our official plan and see whether we can uh, tighten up some of our uh, controls that we do have over growth moving into the future. With that, seeing no further comments, I'll call for the vote. So all those in favor of the recommendation, any opposed, and it is carried. So next is item 12.11, report of Office of the CAO, and it's a council appointment to interim join the <coughs> fire and its advisory committee. So we did discuss this in camera. The recommendation is that report CAO 2022-07 entitled council appointments to interim joint fire governance advisory committee be received as terms of reference for the interim joint fire governance committee attached here to be approved. 
and that the following members of council be appointed to the committee. So, in camera, there was Deputy Mayor James LaDuke, Councillor Roger Sandu, and Councillor Jonathan Scott that the uh, council appointed to this committee. So I wonder whether our CAO could comment about uh, just the process, and we do realize with the election coming up that, uh, that uh, will be dependent on uh, who sits on council. But uh, CAO, could you comment? Thanks, Your Worship. So this uh, report stems from council's adoption of uh, a report from Chief Thomas in June. Uh, that went to our council as well as his both council with respect to narrowing down the model or, or the option for consolidation uh, from uh, you know, three or four initially. Um, and both councils uh, endorsed that report that essentially uh, proved in principle the notion of both of our fire services consolidating. Um, the uh, approval though is subject to a number of steps and uh, negotiations and agreements that uh, both of his colleagues will need to come to over the coming months. Um, with the uh, anticipated time frame of having final recommendations to both councils early in the new term of the new council. So we're, we're uh, projecting for some time in February of 23 to have those recommendations. Uh, the report that you endorsed also uh, established this committee that's in front of you tonight, uh, in terms of reference, have been finalized and are attached to the report to essentially serve in an advisory role to council in, uh, well, over the course of this fall and then uh, obviously into early in 23 as well, uh, to oversee these final uh, negotiations and arriving at a consolidation agreement, arriving at a financial plan, um, uh, establishing the governance uh, approach and committee that will guide the consolidated service uh, as it moves forward in, in the future, if that's the ultimate decision of both councils. Um, so this report was seeking uh, your council's appointees for the committee that will join your three colleagues with, from uh, Innisfil Council to, to sit um, over the coming months. And we certainly appreciate that uh, there are some uh, additional burdens on your plate coming uh, and leading up to, to late October. Um, but in order to keep that aggressive time frame um, and have a decision early in 23 so that that decision can roll out over the course of that year, uh, we've got to stick to this aggressive time frame. So unfortunately, um, there's a, an additional burden on the three gentlemen that, that stepped up this evening. But I'm uh, quite optimistic that uh, we'll be able to work through this and have some really sound plans for the next council's visit. Councilor Baker. So, well, Jeff, uh, the protocol, what happens if, if there's a big change over? Just let's look at the positive and negative. It's like investing money. You have your positive, you have your negative. What happens if something goes negative? Like, what, what, what happens if, uh, yeah, how, the, how does the new council? Uh, pick all this up or whatever the case would be. Say if there's a, ra a radical change or, or, or so something, you know, we had a pandemic, we, we never believed this would happen, but let, let's say, so, you know, how do we deal with all, all that? What fall, a fall guide is there in the document? Uh, thank you, <coughs> Councilor Becky. Yeah. With any work in progress, um, there's always the potential to for a new council to change course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's certainly their, their prerogative. Um, the way that this advisory committee is structured through its terms of reference is that at the end of the term, so once the new council's in place, there'll be a, a pause in, in the effort. Uh, that council will either reappoint or appoint uh, a new committee, um, presuming that that council wants to move forward with, with the process. So uh, certainly there are, there are questions that will need to be answered uh, early in the new term. Um, but that that same prospect applies to any uh, effort that's underway at the time, yeah. not just this one. Yeah, thanks for the explanation. That's all. So yes, and the final decision is a budget time.
so no decision is made until the budget is approved to move forward with the uh, with the decision. So I don't think I got a mover and a second, did I? So can I uh, have a mover and a second? <coughs> on the floor, Councilor Orr, Seconder, Councilor Lamb. So any any other comments, Councilor Orr? Yeah, I, I you know I I know there's some concern about. Uh, putting people in place at this time, but I, I think you made the comment, but we have to understand this. Um, there needs to be some sort of, of, of commitment or, or uh, roadway uh, for the future council's uh, budgeting. And if we leave it till after, uh, then that, that won't be, there won't be anything really, enough time to put that in place to go to budget. So I think it's important, that's why I'm, I'm moving it. I think it's important that it moves forward, uh, recognizing yes, there might be uh, some changes, but um, I think it's important that we, our new council, really understands uh, and has some uh, foresight in where the process is going before they can go to the budget. Council Lamb. Yeah, I'm willing to second it. Um, you know what, if it falls to pieces because of a new council or whatever, or we change direction, uh, if you have a fire or an emergency, phone the fire department, they'll still come. <laughs> okay, uh, Council Conton. Yeah, I, I was a little apprehensive uh, when this uh, document first came forward, but I, I've been satisfied. I Basically, if the new council, whoever that may be, will get the final decision on, on everything that's going to occur, and, and that's the way it should be. Uh, I was a little concerned about the financial impact uh, to residents, especially in one taxation year, which has all been changed. Yes. And, and so I'm looking forward to you bringing this back. There's benefits to the community over time. So I, I agree, like I'm looking at that, I agree. but. We can't hit the residents with a huge taxation bill as well. So I'm looking forward to this committee putting their heads together and, and figuring out how we bring it back to the community at a responsible rate. Okay, with that, I'll call the vote then. All those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? And it was carried. So I just realized we didn't have a revised agenda. So, um, can we go to that? The on-desk item, is that, uh, have I missed that? 2.1? We can go to the on-desk item. Report of Corporate Services Traffic Bylaw Amendment School Location. So the recommendation is that report COR 2022-17 entitled Traffic Bylaw Amendment School Location be received for information. And the Council approved the Traffic Bylaw Amendment <coughs> attached to this report and the Council approved the Community Safety Zone Amendment attached to this report. Mover and a seconder for this. Councilor Sandu, Councilor Dykey, and uh, I'll ask Brent just to comment that this was an on-desk item, so that uh, it's because of the new schools. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor Pepper. Um, so to put it briefly, uh, the Town of Bradford is expecting uh, three new schools, <coughs> two of which will be developed and constructed for September. That would be 691 Simcoe Road, the St. Charles property, and 400 Crossland, the new public school in the Dreamfields uh, subdivision. Um, BWG staff met, uh, we met with the Development Engineering, Transportation Enforcement Divisions. We reviewed the school properties, some of the adjacent streets where we expect vehicles to congregate and traffic to flow, and we're proposing a number of amendments to our traffic bylaws and one amendment to the Community Safety Zone bylaw. Uh, I'm not sure if Council wants me to go through all the details <coughs> um, precisely. Um, what I'll say generally is, um, when the, the new schools were built in Grand Central, the town generally adopted a position where parking would be on the school side to allow uh, pedestrians to unload to the sidewalk and avoid uh, you know, kids crossing the road. Um, that'll be adopted for 400 cross.
Crossland, uh, the Dreamfields property, although there will be a certain portion directly in front of the school, uh, where on street parking will not be available, uh, but to the east and west of that school property, there's plenty of uh, on street parking inventory. The idea is the kids will unload directly the sidewalk, not have to cross the roadway if they choose to drive to school. Um, there's some maps towards the end of the report, which helps explain this a whole lot better uh, visually for you guys, and, and a legend there as well. With the, uh, the St. Charles property, we do expect um, uh, a large um, kiss and ride uh, to be constructed off Simcoe Road. Um, we, we did consult with the school board uh, for a long period of time and, and advocated for that to get as many vehicles off Simcoe and off Tiberini Way, which will be uh, part of Bradford East and, and onto the school property. Uh, the school itself is situated fronting on Tiberini Way. There will be a, a school bus layby directly in front of the school, which uh, takes up a, a large part of the right of way. Um, due to that and, and uh, other considerations in the subdivision, namely a stormwater management pond and a park, for the St. Charles property, we're proposing parking on the opposite side of the school. So it's a little bit of a break from uh, what we've recommended to council in the past. Um, we think that scenario will be uh, safer than the school side uh, for St. Charles. It'll have a, a much greater on-street inventory because there's a storm pond there and there's a park. So you won't have private driveways for, for residents there. You'll have one long unobstructed boulevard where vehicles can stack on each other. They'll be able to unload directly to a sidewalk on the east side of Tipperini Way and then cross the road at a, an all-way controlled stop uh, intersection just south of the school property. Um, so this report tonight proposes changes to on-street parking, on-street stopping, the creation of some of those intersections, and as well a community safety zone on Crossland from its west limit at Langford uh, all the way to Professor Day, which will be its east limit eventually when those roads are connected. Uh, the Community Safety Zone bylaw already incorporates Simcoe Road from Canal to north of uh, Zima, which will incorporate WH Day and the two schools on Simcoe Road. Um, there are some logistics, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, demolishing old St. Charles, removing a lay-by, pedestrian crossovers, um, that I don't have answers for Council tonight. I, I have been working with our colleagues and, and other departments to, to try to uh, do the best that we can there. Um, the Bradford East subdivision is uh, currently under construction, so that will continue for some period of time. The developer is working towards having sidewalks complete um, for, for kids when school starts, and then um, some of the subdivision will be completed uh, from there on out. So I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. I know I jumped around a little bit, but that's a, a brief overview of kind of what the report entails. Okay, thanks, Brad. And, um, yeah, it always uh, causes issues, causes problems uh, with uh, parents dumping up their school children. But uh, just uh, Crossland Boulevard, so you're having no stopping or no parking anywhere on Crossland in front of the on both sides of the street. Uh, how do you expect, yeah. can you expand on that a little bit? Because usually uh, parents will park 50 meters down from the school on the main street going by the schools. Will that uh, cause an issue or will there be enough uh, other places for the parents to, to pick up their children? Yeah, thank you, Mary Pepper. And, and I guess time, time will tell. Um, so for 400 Crossland, the school is, is situated on the property right towards, right towards the sidewalk. So uh, I think for our, our planning policies and, and um, the way it's supposed to function, um, the town requested that the school be moved as close to the front of the property as possible. Um, what that resulted in is um, <coughs> portions along the front of the school cannot be parked in, so the school board can apply with their, their fire road regulations. So the, these are parts of the roadway which would incorporate access for emergency services. It did go through review through uh, planning departments, fire departments, building, as well as uh, development and, and bylaw. Um, this is 
um, something that had to be incorporated. Is it ideal? No. Um, what you'll see on the map there, uh, it doesn't have the school kind of uh, school property or the site plan imposed, but you'll have a primary entrance to the school at Rogers Trail and a, a school kiss and ride towards the west portion of the property opposite from Kids Street. And between those driveways is the designated area where vehicles shouldn't park. So we have that um, marked as a, a no stopping. But certainly to the east and west of the school property is undeveloped land, so that we don't expect any time shortly to be any houses or, or development applications in. So similar to the St. Charles property, these will be long, unobstructed boulevard areas where parents can park outside of the direct frontage of the property, get right to the sidewalk, and then walk down the sidewalk to the school property. I mean, a parent on a, on a you know, busy morning, weekday morning, they're gonna to try to find the first spot in front of the school. You know, we recognize that. This is something that's new for us as well. We'll try to push them off to the sides to uh, load and unload. Okay, thanks, Brant. And so yeah, I can see that it'll be uh, uh, a process <laughs> to educate the parents as well as to see uh, what human nature, uh, yeah, uh, leads towards, uh, Solution that works for everybody. Uh, other questions or comments? Councilor Day. Yeah, good job, uh, Brent. You have your hand full and quite a, quite a good uh, good report. My question is that uh, down Simcoe Road, when is that other school going to be open? Uh, Simcoe Road. I, I, hear, I hear rumors from different contractors. They were talking the end of uh, October, and, and uh, you know <coughs> that, that's going to cause even uh, a, a bigger concern of, of how we plan this, plan all the safety for the residents. And, and you have enough staff to, to, to you know to you know deal with all this when, when this all hit, hit all um, reveals and happens. Uh, through Mayor Kepper to, to Councillor Dyke. So, so the good thing is um, the the amendments we're proposing to Simple Road will, will incorporate both schools. So, the, the future school property is seven four two as well as St. Charles. There are some side streets, Gulfview, Gibson, that we're going to. Uh, put some signs in place to keep the intersections clear and these other safety requirements that we typically go through. So, so that's fine. I don't have a date that, that's been provided to me when that school open. You only you hear things. So um, uh, I'm expecting some time uh, late of this year or early next year, but uh, I don't know. In terms of our staff, uh, it's a great point. It is, it's a challenge that we have. Uh, enforcement officers are out at school zones every day. Uh, at times it feels like, you know, um, we're the sole department kind of carrying that enforcement in, in front of these uh, school areas. They're very difficult interactions with people. They're very, um, uh, they're hard on, hard on the staff. Uh, and it's hard to deal with. Um, so with three new properties coming online, it just spreads the officers even thinner than, than what we had before. We don't have enough officers to attend every school every day. So we try to prioritize based on feedback from residents, what we're hearing from council, uh, other departments and try to do the best we can. Councilor Scott? Um, I had a reason to be on Tiberi Way a few weekends ago, uh, somewhat related to this meeting that I won't go into, but um, it dead ends right now. So how are we going to accommodate that flow of traffic until Daniel Lane comes online? Other than we're not, we're going to make it work. <coughs> I don't want to step on any other department's toes or, or promise something that, that I can't deliver. My understanding is, is Daniel's not going to be open for the start of the school year, yeah. and there's going to be some sort of roundabout or way for vehicles to kind of redirect um, from one southbound to, to northbound. I, I'm kind of hoping personally that the subdivision, there are houses there that are occupied, so you will have some walkers. <coughs> if you're driving from outside of Bradford East, I would hope you'd, you'd use the entrance <coughs> off Simple Road as opposed to driving through the subdivision. Um, I have had conversations with the principal. We're going to try to push some things that we think may be appropriate or the parents should hear and try to direct them uh, to the right areas. Uh, other comments, questions? Councillor Orr? Uh, I'll make it quick, Brenda. You know, thanks for the report and, and you've done a lot of work here knowing that uh, um, background from other schools and I'm quite sure that uh, changes might be needed to be made based on your observations going forward. 
and uh, we know you'll make those when you need to uh, do that. And thanks for all the work that uh, you put into this. And, and we want to keep our kids safe, but uh, everybody else has to, parents and everyone has to uh, cooperate. So thank you. Okay, hey, other comments? Uh, Deputy Branch. Just a quick question, Brent, to you. And uh, you know, you're obviously doing school board. What are you doing with the superintendent, or are you doing with somebody at the school board level? I, I'm just curious about the kiss and rights. I've seen them get closed down by the principal. They have the ultimate say apparently on yeah. the property. So, uh, are we going to get assurances that they're going to keep the kiss and rights open and, and viable for uh, drop off? Yeah, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly been talking to planning and, and uh, development staff at the, at the school board. Um, for the St. Charles property, because the Kiss and Ride plays such a prominent role in how the school functions, I mean, this Kiss and Ride is huge. From, all the way from Simcoe to the new school property, um, I'd be very surprised. <coughs> we have commented them directly that that has a direct impact on municipal roadways and our ability to manage traffic on them. Um, we've been provided some loose assurances, nothing that is enforceable or, or, or legal at this point. And uh, we'll just try to work with them as partners to to keep them open. Hey, thanks for that explanation, Brent. And I know that we have had meetings. Mayor Dolan has uh, spearheaded with us at the mayors and deputy mayors to talk to the school boards to be able to uh, work together to be able to find investigations. Other comments, Councilor Crenshaw. Yeah, I, uh, I just want to thank you for the report and thank you for coming out today to look after that issue with me as well. Uh, the kiss and rides are important. Uh, Fred C. Cook is a fine example of that. Uh, there's a school that functions quite well. Um, I have uh, probably very little complaints that actually come from that area. Uh, because the kiss and ride is actually used, right? Uh, I've been to other areas in my board and been there multiple, multiple times where they can park in the intersection. Uh, people don't understand that you can't park in an intersection. Like, I don't get it. Uh, we shouldn't have to tell you what, what you need to do to actually get a license, right? Uh, so in saying that, I see, you know, we're looking at another area and, and we're asking people to not park in front of a school and actually cross the road and, and do things properly. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but I, I give you and your team credit. Uh, you do good work. Uh, trust me, you're busy. Um, so well, let's see what happens and we'll address it from there. Most people don't walk in for you. Three doors down. Okay, we've had a good discussion. Okay. So I did have a mover and a seconder for this, so I'll call for the vote. No, I didn't have a mover and a seconder. So a mover and a seconder then. Councilor Lamb, Councilor Dykey, call for the vote then. All those in favor? And it is approved. So next is request for staff report. So does any member of council have a request for staff report? Um, Councilor Lamb? Yes. Um, I was invited out to, and I think some of the council, but it was on the weekend for all of council, um, and uh, the deputy mayor and, uh, and uh, um, Councillor uh, Sandu was there as well. We now have something called the Bradford Cricket Club, yes. and they got no place to play. And they have kind of uh, went out to uh, Henderson Park, staff's aware of it. But you know, when you're when you this it's kind of like baseball. It's not like baseball, and you actually bowl the ball and try to knock the uh, wicket over, and the guy's got to bat it and stuff. And it's actually just the, even the park down the street from where Raj lives. There was a couple of kids out there, and uh, you know, whacking around a, uh, a cricket uh, ball with a couple of bats and stuff. So what we were talking about was get a staff report um, and look at what it would take to put a proper pitch in. What I mean by pitch is the three, three meters by 20 meter pitch 
where they bowl and they run up and throw the ball and you got to bounce the ball and then try to get it by the batter. Doesn't mean the whole cricket field, it's it's just the, the pitch. And so it's like 66 feet by three feet. It's kind of like a, you know, the size of a pitcher of baseball on the whole plate. Uh, is there a possibility of us looking at putting a proper uh, pitch in out in Henderson Park and then maybe uh, you know, doing doing the chalk line so that they can play within the field. His kids are going to uh, Bond to play. Uh, show our uh, Alliston, uh, King City, Brampton, Toronto, and there's this. We we've always provided an arena. We've always provided a baseball diamond. Well, you know what? We got to do other things here, and this would be such a, an inexpensive. Uh, solution to get things going because I know in the Anderson Park plan there is plans for a, a, a cricket pitch um, and I think that if we did this sooner than later uh, look at it uh, this year and see that of all the money we've saved during uh, you know from some of the projects we've done if we can find fifteen thousand dollars or somewhere in that range and put a proper pitch in so that people can go out and practice and play and have some fun uh, we had a great time there, and uh, I had learned a lot about it, and uh, I have been to cricket grounds in England and stuff like that, and it is a worldwide game. The Windies play West Indies, the South Africa, uh, South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Europe. So cricket is a large worldwide um, sport, and I think that in order to allow people in our community to enjoy the game, they shouldn't have to travel somewhere else. Uh, they should keep their money and their fuel here and, and uh, go to the restaurant here instead of in, uh, in Vaughan. So I would like to hear it, uh, see a staff report whereby we look at investigation of a cricket pitch, which is like I said, it's 66 feet by, by 10 feet wide and planted in the middle of of uh, one of or out on out on uh, uh, Henderson Park, and you can go out there and you can see what they what they've done by just merely mowing in that. But it's rough, and so it's not about the pit, the, the field itself. <coughs> it's about the pitch. So when you're pitching, that ball should spin forward. Uh, it shouldn't go sideways and hit you in the knee and stuff. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, I could get support of council to move this and ask for. A, a staff report sooner than later to uh, start this process going. And then, you know, I mean, you know, you, you can have a, a cricket field with the pitch uh, with just a 40, with 46 meters. And then you could go out, you know, up to 150 meters, but they don't necessarily need that. And when, how they mount the, or marking the boundaries with, with, with cones. So, uh, but they were still out there playing and having some fun. So I really hope that I get support and that we can, we can move ahead with a report on this and look at what we have in our recreation budget um, and uh, see if we can get it going. Probably a little late this year because of uh, timing and, and that, but uh, let's, let's, let's plan for, uh, for this to, to get the ball rolling. Okay, thank you, Council. <coughs> so moved by Council Lamb. Can I have a seconder for a request for staff report? Uh, Council Sandu, we'll second that. Any further comments? Council Sandu. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think in their own wisdom, they thought they were helping the town staff by mowing that and making it into a pitch. Um, I'm gonna have a chat with them and tell them to go through the proper channels next time and, and get it done right. Um, I, I think with the staff report, we know in the long term plans we are going to look at it. Um, but I think the the ask is to do something in the short term. So when we're looking at a cricket pitch five years, six years down the road, we're not traveling to places that you mentioned for those five years for the residents that, that live here. It's all about live and play here. 
We're still working outside. Thanks. Okay. Um, any other requests for any different staff report? Councilor Contoff. Thank you, Worship. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been talking to a lot of folks over around David and Rebecca and, and Queen and, and Church, and uh, I've been walking the little streets uh, talking to folks. A lot of them are uh, okay with the hub. They, they like the fact that the hub is there, uh, and but they want certain things in that area as well. So there was a lot of concern about the open property at the back uh, of uh, the existing building. And, and, you know, I had discussions with them. I said, with the value of land uh, today, it would be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be uh, very wise of, of council not to look at the uh, property to see if it was big enough for another building envelope, maybe the arts or whatever. Uh, so they understood that. And they said, if, if you can't have a component with the arts, we would like to see a, a park. And I thought, okay, so, I agree, that is an older sector. I, there's not much parkland around that sector. Um, so, you know, would it be an enhancement to that area? Of course it would. Uh, that, uh, so I'd like to see a staff report to figure out if the land envelope at the back of the property is big enough for a, uh, a building component, or if it's uh, viable to turn into a park with maybe a band shelter. Uh, and maybe somehow we run a conduit with the tower and, and make this for the community. But they wanted to see things back there for either small children or the arts. So I guess my question is, is the property uh, 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 volume big enough for another uh, building at the back side of that? And, and if it's not, is there a component that we can replace the park and how would we Okay, thanks. Nice. Moved by Councillor Conchbach. Well, the seconder then, Councillor Scott. So that uh, so we have the request for two staff reports then. So I'll call for the vote then on both of them, both staff reports. I think we're all in agreement. So all those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. Okay, we'll move on to item 14, committee minutes and recommendations. 14.1, Heritage Committee minutes, meeting minutes, June 16, 2022. So the recommendation is that the minutes of the June 16, 2022, Heritage Committee meeting be received. Mover and a seconder for this, uh, Councillor Orr, Councillor Scott. Any comments or questions? Councillor Orr? Yeah, just, just wanted to bring up a few comments uh, uh, that uh, came through the committee report. Um, that the HCD is uh, progressing, the Heritage District and Bondhead uh, is uh, progressing and hopefully uh, to have a uh, in-person uh, public meeting in uh, September to uh, finalize what uh, the public and Bondhead are, uh, are feeling about how uh, the uh, process is going for the Heritage District. And um, the, the other thing is the Concerned about the uh, uh, the Fritzy Cook property the, on Queen Street and, and how that's progressing, and uh, um, there's been a lot of concern with how slow it's been going. And uh, I think uh, I even saw on I don't know why uh, they're boarding up the windows again. Yeah. Uh, and is that stopping uh, what they're doing right now, or is that for? Uh, working inside, I, I'm not sure, but uh, there was just some concern how that's progressing. So I just wanted to bring up, I think it's uh, imperative that uh, everybody knows the HCD is progressing for uh, the future now. Hopefully in September, we'll have a meeting. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councilor. And uh, our planning staff, they, they do have a site plan. Uh, before our planning staff, and I, uh, according to our planning staff, they are quite excited about moving forward and getting work done as soon as possible. So I think that the reason they were boarding up the, the windows was to make sure no more damage was done and to make sure that the uh, vandals couldn't get in. So I, uh, I did ask about that so that I think that there was a, a good reason for why they were doing that. 
Any other comments or questions on the Heritage Committee? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And that is carried. Healthy Communities Advisory Committee, recommendation that the minutes of the June 15, 2022 Healthy Communities Advisory Committee meeting be received. Mover and a seconder for this. Deputy Mayor of Duke, Council Scott. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried. So we move on to bylaws. <coughs> to the uh, recommendation that bylaws 2022 72-71, 2022-73, 2022-74, and there are two other bylaws, 2022-76 and 2022-77 be enacted. So a mover and a seconder for this, Councillor Lamb, Deputy Mayor LaDuke. Any comments on any of the bylaws that I mentioned there? Usually I read them off, but I didn't tonight. Just uh, the last two were the community safety zones that uh, seeing none then, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And that is carried. So we'll move on to item 17, announcements. We do have uh, two slides with the uh, different announcements on the different uh, July proclamations and then August proclamations moving forward. <coughs> National Peacekeepers Week. So we are planning to have a flag raising just to be determined about the actual uh, time, but. Uh, Yes, that, uh, before COVID, that was quite a you know, moving flag raising, so we'll try to uh, carry on and, and have that again. The music in the park, tomorrow night, the last music in the park, and then uh, outdoor movies will start near the end of August, August 23rd. Of course, haircuts. So on the cultural night with the diversity action group. So we do just have on the bottom there that the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has their annual general meeting and conference in Ottawa on August 14th and 17th. So some members of council will be there. We'll be meeting with the uh, cabinet minister to the provincial government to further the town business. So um, because of that, uh, there won't be enough time uh, for August uh, 16th in council. So any other announcements? Seeing none, are there any notices of motions? We'll move on to item 19, confirm proceedings. So the recommendation is that bylaw 2022-75, bylaw to confirm proceedings of the council meeting dated August 2nd, 2022, be enacted. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Orr, all in favor? And it's carried. And adjournment recommendation that the meeting is hereby adjourned at 10 p.m. Mover and a seconder for this. Councilor Scott, Deputy Mayor Duke, all in favor, and it is great. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.